right. Looks like we are live and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and I am your host and moderator for tonight's exciting program. It is a privilege to have Dr. William Bell and Pastor Scott Clem here with me to debate the topic of the resurrection of the dead, past or future. Dr. Bell takes the full preterist view for this debate, and Pastor Scott Clem takes the futurist one. I am pumped for this debate. I've been looking forward to this debate uh, for a while. I've wanted to see uh, these gentlemen go at it in the debate octagon for a while now, as they are two true professionals, and they are very knowledgeable and well-studied on the topic of end times theology and eschatology. And so uh, this is guaranteed to be a debate to remember. Scott and William, let's get acquainted before we get into opening statements and just kind of break the ice a little bit. Dr. William Bell, let's let's start with you. It's been uh, several months since you've been here. The last time you were here was for your debate on a similar topic, full preterism with Dr. Sam Frost. That was a fantastic debate. And so I really appreciate you giving us your time for, for yet another event. So William, how have you been? And also a little bit about yourself. All right, thank you. Well, I've been doing quite well. Um, Donnie, appreciate the um, opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, it has been, a, I guess, a couple of months or so since the first time that I appeared on your broadcast and, and platform. I'm very, um, very grateful for the opportunity. I'm also thankful for Scott in um, allowing this to take place. I um, have um, been thinking about this for, for a minute, and, um, and I think that, you know, some good information will come out of this. Uh, a little bit about my um, background. Of course, you know, I'm married. Uh, I've been married for quite some time. Uh, I have three children, four grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. One just arrived uh, a few weeks ago, I guess. At any rate, um, I am uh, delighted to be here. I have been a full preterist for, it'll be 45 years this November. And um, so I've studied and spoken on the subject around the country, um, as well as in uh, Nicaragua, uh, three countries in Australia, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and countries like Ghana, and um, several places there. In addition, I um, work with some people in um, uh, Nigeria. In addition, we have a preaching school um, in India where uh, Brother Hanuk, Adamala Hanuk, runs the school and they train about 30, 25 to 30 preachers every year. And so they, um, he does a great job. He's baptizing a lot of people. And uh, so that's uh, one of our, you know, extended uh, mission works, et cetera. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the subject of full preterism as it relates to the resurrection, focusing on 1 Corinthians 15 and on 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. I haven't had much rest. I have to admit that. <laughs> much rest at all. And uh, so I'm I'm just trying to survive here tonight in terms of my energy level. And I hope that it's, it's up. Maybe after we get started, it will uh, boost a bit. I um, attended the Memphis School of Preaching and Seminary and then... Um, my my degree is an honorary degree, so I just you know leave it at that. Uh, it was given uh, and granted because of my work in eschatology, and uh, part of my master's was um, both from some of my work as well as my experience as well as uh, some of the coursework that was done. So um, that's a little bit about my background. I uh, can't think of anything else at this point. I'm gonna try to save as much of my energy and. Um, <laughs> focus as I can. Uh, this this just happens to be one of those times when um, I'm, a, I'm a bit fatigued coming into it. So please overlook that. I'm not making any apologies. That's just the way it is. I do have one question, however. Sure. Um, are we able during the discussion to see what's going on in the audience or no? To, to see, Yes. Well, if you want to see what the live chat is saying, 
then mm -hmm. at the side of the StreamYard tab, William, you're probably in the private chat. At the very top, there's another option that says comment. So if you click click comments, you'll see our lively live chat. Okay. <laughs> so All right. There's a lot of people excited okay. for this. There we go. I see. Yes. All right. I, don't get you know, too I'm, distracted by the live. No, chat. I won't. I won't get distracted. <laughs> I, I just kind of want. I know the last time I never saw anything that was going on, and I, I, um, I know that when I'm watching other people, I see it. So I just wasn't sure as to how that, um, how that worked. No problem. Clearly, I'm not the only one excited and pumped for this. We've already got over 100 people in the live chat ready to watch you gentlemen engage in tonight's debate. Uh, William, you're one of the best here to uh, to be here to defend the full Predator's view. So you've been uh, engaging in this issue for years, as, as you've put it. And so for those who want to see more from William Bell, please do check the description box. All things fulfilled eschatology. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's your YouTube channel, and so that is linked for people to to see. And I'm sure these opening statements will give you that much needed energy boost, William. So again, I appreciate the the intro, and also thanks so much for being here. Okay, Pastor Scott Clem, always a pleasure to have you as well. You're certainly no stranger to debates, nor a stranger to eschatology. And so I think this is a great matchup for tonight's debate. So Scott, how have you been? The last time you were here was with your uh, great Matthew 24 debate with uh, Pastor Kirby Tab. That was a fantastic debate as well. So how have you been? A little bit about yourself, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Donnie. And glad to be back again. This is always fun. It's always a treat. And uh, I'm, I'm with you, William. I, uh, you know, Usually I come into these debates and I've got my my trusty, you know, Red Bull here, you know, to try to give me a boost here. I don't know if I'll need that or, or not, but, um, you know, late in the day and everything, everybody's a little bit more tired and all that kind of stuff. But I'm sure we'll we'll get into it and our energy will will not lack. Um, yeah, it's cold here. It's super cold. I was just telling telling these gentlemen, it's like negative 19 degrees and I think it, it feels the wind chills like negative 42. So it is cold old here where I'm at. And I just had a really busy, well, a, a busy few weeks, I guess you could say. So in addition to wearing the has, uh, the pastor hat and the, the dad hat, I got five kids and the husband hat. Um, you know, I also, I also have another hat, which is the, uh, the chairman of our county uh, Republican Party. And so we recently just had a fundraiser. We did that um, about a week ago, uh, so last Saturday. And we have other things going on as well as far as caucus and convention. And then on top of all of that as well, we had a vacancy in our county commission. And so um, by statute, uh, you know, the Republican Party has a role in filling that vacancy. And so I've been just kind of swamped with with that. Um, it's otherwise kind of a, you know, it's not as not as busy as as one might think it is. But there are seasons and this is definitely one of those seasons. And so in addition to all that, I've got my YouTube channel as well. Um, but that's that's been kind of dormant. Um, and I and I apologize for for that. Um, I have a lot of lofty ambitions. And a lot of things that I want to do, and I find that I only have so much time. And so um, I want to be more active with that. And, and Lord willing, um, I will. Again, you know, different seasons, and I think people people recognize that. But I'm looking forward to this debate tonight as well. I, I think this is fun. Um, you know, I, I... I, I'm more familiar now with full preterism than I than I previously was, and so I think I have a, a pretty good idea um, of of where uh, you know William comes from as well as others. I know there's you know it's 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 not a a, a one size fits all. There's uh, certainly many different branches you might say within full preterism, but I think I have a pretty good understanding. And of course, you know, I'm still learning some things as well. So tonight ought to be fun as we look at the scriptures and look at the resurrection. And, uh, you know, my goal tonight, hopefully, is to, um, you know, get people to to ask some good, solid questions as they search the scriptures. 
And you'll notice that he, even here tonight. <clears throat> and so, William, just forewarning, um, as, as you ask me questions and I ask you, I often, and, and just, just keep this in the back of your mind, I often, when I start to answer questions, I, I ask questions. And I'm not expecting you to answer those questions. This is more of how my thought process goes. You know, I try to ask questions and answer those to develop an answer. And so you'll hear me do some of that tonight as well. But um, all the housekeeping stuff aside, I'm excited to be here. And Donnie, thank you for this platform. And uh, I see if you're up to like 22,000 subscribers now, I think, which is pretty awesome. The thing just I keeps do. growing and growing and growing. And so for those who haven't subscribed, you know, put a shameless plug out for you. Please subscribe to the channel and, and support what Donnie's doing. Thanks. Scott, I appreciate that. Yes, we just hit 22,000 subscribers last night. So just in time for this much anticipated debate on the resurrection of the dead. Scott, thank you for the introduction. The Red Bull is the secret. My secret is, is lots of coffee. You know, yeah. us in yeah. Canada, we, we love our, our Tim Hortons coffee, I should say. And so, okay, William, Scott, I really do appreciate uh, the introductions. Uh, for those who want to see more from Scott, I've also got Scott's channel linked in the description box, preaching and politics. So to the audience, please do check the description box for more from our debaters tonight. And with that, let me go over tonight's format. <clears throat> so it is going to be a comprehensive one, as I believe debates of this magnitude, debates on this topic uh, should be. It's an important topic. And so we're going to be having opening statements. Scott will be kicking us off with his opening statement. He's taking the uh, future position in terms of uh, tonight's topic. And then we're going to have two rebuttals. So first rebuttal, 10 minutes. Second rebuttal, another 10 minutes. And then we're going to jump into 50 minutes of cross-examination, 25 minutes each. Uh, William Bell and Scott Clem will each get the opportunity to lead the way in, in questions. Then we'll have closing statements, five minutes each in order to wrap up our thoughts and points for tonight. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We will be, as always, having an audience Q&A. And so please, if you do have a question for William, you've got a question for Scott, just let me know and do your best to tag me as uh, we've got quite a bit of people in our live chat tonight. I don't want to miss your question. So tag me at either Standing for Truth or at Donnie, and that way I won't miss it. Okay, we're going to get right into our first opening statement for tonight, which is 20 minutes. And Scott, as I get the timer ready, you can get your slides up, which I see down here. So I'll put it up on the screen. And you're good to go, Scott. The floor is yours. Very good. Hey, a quick question for you, Donnie, just so yes. I'm sure. So, um, so I'm going to give my opening statement and then is William going to give his and then we do cross examination. Is that how we're doing that? Yes, we're going to go. Uh, so your opening statement, 20 minutes, then William's going to give his uh, 20 minute opening statement. But before Perfect. cross exam, we do have two rounds of uh, uninterrupted rebuttals. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. I just, um, I wasn't sure. Should have asked that before. So no worries. You're good. All right. Very good. I'll go ahead and get the, uh, the time started here and away we go. All right. So I do have a PowerPoint slide here. So, uh, just kind of to go through some of this. So, uh, bear with me. Uh, first of all, as far as introduction, right. And as we think about early Christianity, Early Christianity was a resurrection movement through and through. It was built upon the Jewish idea of eschatological hope. Resurrection was very much a part of this Jewish hope, though it was not agreed to by all, and it was denied by some. So even with the different Jewish uh, factions, like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Essenes, there was disagreement on, on the idea of a resurrection. The Sadducees, most people know, denied it completely. So, for example, the eschatological hope of, of all of the different Jewish groups, um, they, they shared some common ideas, regardless of where they kind of stood on the idea of resurrection. They believed that the prophesied Davidic monarch would come to bring ultimate judgment to their enemies. 
which they thought were the pagans. Um, and, of course, also upon unfaithful Israelites. Uh, they believed that God would return to his, uh, to his uh, temple and that he would bring an end of exile, ushering in a new age. Now, some groups, like the Pharisees and Essenes, uh, they believe that this would result in the end of sin and death, and that the righteous dead of the previous ages would be physically raised to share in God's restored creation. Early Christianity believed and taught that Israel's eschatological hope was, in fact, coming to pass but not the way that the Jews anticipated. It was happening in Jesus' way and at his initiative. Further, early Christianity stated much more precisely what exactly resurrection involved. It meant going through death and out into a new kind of bodily existence beyond, and that it was happening in two stages, with Jesus first and everyone else later on. Further, through bodily resurrection, of which the early Christians spoke, um, remained firmly in the future. And it colored and gave shape to present Christian li living. So how they lived in the present was determined much by the resurrection hope. And the main point here is that whereas Jewish groups saw resurrection and judgment taking place all at once at the end of the age, so, for instance, in John eleven twenty four, we get that idea. Early Christianity states that resurrection happens in two stages. First for Jesus, and then for everybody else. And that this was, uh, was with an overlap of the present wicked age and the new age to come. Further, what kind of resurrection a person would experience, be it the resurrection unto eternal life or eternal condemnation, is contingent upon what one does with the resurrected Christ, either receiving Christ by faith and thus sharing in his death, burial, and resurrection to receive eternal life, or rejecting Christ and remaining um, and, and remaining under God's wrath. So <clears throat> I thought maybe an illustration would kind of help here as far as to, to illustrate this. Of course, we have the first resurrection. The Gospels all record this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as far as the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Of course, his death, burial, and resurrection. Of course, we know this happened around 30 AD. So this is stage one, or what we would call the first resurrection. And I'm going to be using those terms, first resurrection and second resurrection. You can, uh, I'm taking that more so from Revelation chapter 20 more than anywhere else. And then we have the second stage, this second resurrection, in which we have the resurrection of life for, for the righteous, and we have the resurrection of damnation taking place at the end of this present wicked age. So this little blue dot here just represents a person who is, who is you know, alive, like you and I, uh, let's say an unregenerate person. How does this unregenerate person get to resurrection? Well, they have to die. They have to join in Christ's uh, death, in his burial, in his resurrection. So, and, and then as a result of that, they are in Christ. So what I'm trying to establish here is a person, if they, if in order for a person to receive bodily resurrection themselves, they first have to take part in Jesus' resurrection. They have to take part in, in the first resurrection. Now, the first resurrection was indeed bodily. It was, it was Jesus' own resurrection. But here we have an individual who, who is, has to make a choice to receive Christ or re, to reject him. And as we see like in places in Romans chapter 6, a person dies with Christ, is buried with Christ, is risen again with Christ. Christ, such that we are we are in Christ. We are we are a new creation, a new humanity, one new man in Jesus. And the key there is that we are in Christ. We share in his identity. We share in his death, burial, and resurrection. And as a result of that, as a result of being spiritually made alive, uh, quickened, if you will, um, or or spiritually raised, however you want to say that. That, in turn, leads to the second resurrection later on. But let's say the same individual, they reject Christ. Well, what happens? 
Well, they're going to die one way or the other. They can either die with Christ or they can die in their sins. If they die in their sins, which is representative of these black arrows, is going to be a resurrection of, of damnation. Now, you see this little red circle there. This red circle, this, this first resurrection, is what I believe has been going on ever since Jesus raised from the dead. This is what was going on between 30 AD and 70 AD. In that, people died with Christ, they were buried with Christ, and they were raised with Christ. They were seated with Christ in the heavens. They were sitting in his throne, even as he was sitting in his throne. And so they share in this resurrection, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so it's important to realize that. Now I want to segue over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says, And of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, uh, but, sh uh, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and the word will, doth, uh, will eat as doth the canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. I want to just part here just for a second to talk about uh, really, what is um, this? This passage right here talks about those who would say that resurrection is the past, and I know it's not quite the equivalent as full preterism is today. But there, there are some things that we can we can learn from this, and it's important that we do learn from this. So this example that Paul gives, um, he, he talks about striving about words to no profit arguing about words, arguing about the meaning of different words. And the example that Paul gives is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who say that the resurrection has taken place already in the past. Now, this letter that, that he wrote here in 2 Timothy, it was written around 67 AD. Question, had Christ, was Christ raised by um, you know, at, at this time? Had Christ already uh, you know, risen from the dead? Let me get to this other screen here. Well, of course, yes, that's, he absolutely did. He was raised from the dead um, at this time that this letter was written. Were believers like Paul already risen with Christ being, quote unquote, in Christ? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. Thus, according to Paul's own writings, every single believer was raised to new life in Christ in 67 AD participating in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Thus, in one sense, every single believer in Christ prior to 70 AD had taken part in the first resurrection, in which they were corporately all made one body of Christ, whose body was ascended into heaven, enthroned at God's right hand, and filled both heaven and earth according to Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians 1 and 2. Is this the resurrection that Paul accused Hymenaeus and Philetus of saying that it has already taken place? Well, of course not, because that's Paul's own teaching, is that people have died and been buried and risen again with, with Christ, taking part in that first resurrection. If believers had already experienced the first resurrection, being quote-unquote in Christ, and corporately raised to new life in and with him, then what is the resurrection that Paul accused Hymenaeus and Philetus of saying that it's already taken place? Well, it's the resurrection of believers. It's that second stage, the second resurrection. Both stages of resurrection involve real physical bodies. The first stage was Jesus's physical body. The second stage is our own. So at stake here is, you know, what does the word resurrection mean? Get back over to the screen. <clears throat> what does this word resurrection mean? Well, based on the context, we can surmise that Hymenaeus and Philetus were striving about what resurrection really meant. Resurrection doesn't mean resurrection, at least not in the way they thought. It meant something else. Now there's a warning here from this passage. The warning is that it leads to the ruin of those who listen. 
you know, striving about words is meant to subvert what people have traditionally thought. Subverting people's thinking um, and, and worldview isn't always a bad thing. Um, you know, when especially when we think about um, you know atheism or, or or whatnot or bad ideas, we rely on Christian apologetics to subvert those kind of bad bad worldviews, that bad thinking. The warning here is that the proper beliefs can uh, that that proper beliefs can be subverted by arguing over what a word really means. And so we said, study to show thyself approved unto God, being able to correctly teach God's word. Now, the effect of such error, error, it will produce ungodliness and it spreads like gangrene or a cancer. It's corrosive. It corrupts. If one modifies what resurrection means, the poison spreads, it spreads to other areas like eschatology, Christology, soteriology, pneumatology, such that those who have questioned the resurrection have had their faith overthrown, which is prevalent amongst full preterism. It's not surprising that those who would embrace what I would call the gangrene of full preterism, which is to say that the resurrection is past already, end up being more, um, more corruptive, um, it, it, turning to views like universalism or Israel only, or that they leave the faith altogether becoming atheists. Now at stake here is how did the first century believers understand resurrection? What did they think that it meant? And this is important because William and I, you know, no doubt we will read the same words in our same Bibles. But if we don't understand the words correctly, if we don't agree what those definitions are, <clears throat> it doesn't matter how much scripture that William or I quote. You know, if, if on some Sunday afternoon you heard a friend say, you know, the Cowboys slaughtered the Chiefs, how would you interpret that? Well, given our modern American context and the familiarity and popularity of American football, whose games are often held on Sundays, it would be rational and logical to interpret the phrase as referring to the outcome of an athletic game. If this phrase was uttered in the 1880s, however, or found in a written document from that era, would it mean the same thing? You see, in full recognition that the words do matter and in acknowledging that the sentence, you know, uh, uh, like uh, in this example, that hasn't changed, the context and worldview in which these words are spoken or written has a significant effect on what is actually being communicated. Different worldviews will assign different meanings to the exact same words. And in their respective contexts, they would both be correct. The error would be, as in this example, to read a modern worldview or a modern worldview meaning into the phrase that was as it was spoken in the 1880s, for example, or vice versa. If we want to know what the, wor uh, what the world, heaven, and resurrection meant to the ones who recorded these words, the hard work of studying needs to be undertaken. And in doing so, we'll either conform our thoughts to the Bible letting go of false notions, no matter how dear, or will resist the truth and hang on to a false idol that we've erected in our own minds, making scripture conform to it. So the example of, of Jesus's own resurrection and, and, its, and its place within the broader Jewish uh, uh, expectation is key for under, understanding what did they mean by resurrection. And we'll examine that more as we get into 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5. So how did they understand it? Well, early Christianity, uh, they, they all recognized that resurrection was in fact bodily. They did not have a, a platonic or a, a Gnostic view. The idea that there was existence uh, after death, some kind of existence, it was not a new thing. And nobody during the first century thought of that as resurrection. Uh, the Greeks themselves had this platonic idea of an immortal soul that was trapped inside of their body. And that the goal was to, to shed this prison of a body so that we could escape and go to a better non-temporal, non-spatial non-material heaven for, for all of eternity. 
that was not resurrection in their minds. Resurrection, in fact, was something that was bodily. It was, was something that was physical. Um, for, the, for the Platonist, the Gnostic, everything is spiritual. Nothing is physical. But that's just not the way that it is in our own scriptures. Along with this, it, it doesn't adhere to the eschatological hope and expectation of Israel. See, we're not, we're not saved for heaven. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not saved to escape this earth and go to a, a non-material place somewhere else. Rather, we were created for earth and we are saved for earth. Salvation is about new creation. It's about the reunification of heaven and earth. Believers are the means, Romans 8 talks about, by which the earth will be renewed. And our present vocation as believers in Christ, who are the quote-unquote body of Christ, is to share in a suffering world, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, bring the light of the gospel to others. The work of salvation is not just about what, what God does in and for us, but about what God is doing through us as agents of new creation in the here and now. In other words, it's not just about going to heaven, but about what happens here on earth. And this affects, of course, the mission of the church. The point of, of resurrection is not that this you know, present bodily life is valueless just because it will die. God will raise it to new life so that what you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. Um, let me let me just turn over here first uh, next. And Donnie, let's see if we can. Um, let me stop sharing that. <clears throat> Scott, and let me go back. And you over. just hit the 18 yeah. minute mark. So you got two minutes left. Perfect. Yeah, let's let's go over. Let me share a different screen here. Oh, sure. I'll pause your timer you for you. Sure. Yeah, go over to, I got that queued up to, to logos to here. First Corinthians 15 is a classic passage on the resurrection. And, and one of the reasons that Paul is arguing or that, that writes about this is, is, is putting forth these arguments is because there are some who say that, that the resurrection is, um, is, is not a thing. Verse 12 in particular. Now, if Christ, uh, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 is, is it's Paul's response that, yes, in fact, Jesus did physically, bodily raise from the dead. What that means for believers now in the present and what that will ultimately mean for people in the future. I just want to jump here to verse 20 through 23, about a minute left. He says here, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them which slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice the order, but every man in his own order. There's two, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Christ is the first fruits, all right? And the second is after, uh, after his coming. And you'll notice here what, what happens. Uh, he says, then cometh the end. And he goes on and he says in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, I'm just going to kind of put those things out there for now just to have people marinate on that. I, I know William and I will get into this more. So I uh, get into the cross uh, examination uh, portion here. But I want to put that out there. These are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. All right. I'll stop it there. Thank you. Okay, Scott, I appreciate the 20-minute opening statement. To the audience, I am all caught up on your questions. I do appreciate how uh, engaged the audience is already, and we've only gone through one 20-minute opening statement. And so with that, we are now going to hand it over to William Bell. William, I'm not sure if it was your intention. Your, your webcam is currently off, but I'm not sure if that was what you planned to do. And then you're also on mute, William. But whenever you're, okay, you're unmuted now. But whenever you're ready, you have your 20-minute opening statement. If you need me to share your screen at any point, just let me know, and I'll get yeah. those slides up for you. 
for you. I'll have you share it in just a moment. <clears throat> sure. All right. I appreciate the presentation from Scott and um, looks like we're going to have a very good uh, discussion tonight. So I'm, I'm interested in um, pursuing this further as we go along. I want to say that I'm here to affirm that the resurrection of the dead was fulfilled in the first century in 70 AD as the fulfillment of the promises and prophecies of the um, law and the prophets and um, that it is not about a physical body coming out of the ground as far as believers are concerned and that the meaning of Christ's uh, resurrection which we do not deny uh, is much deeper than simply his body coming out of the ground and I have evidence for that both from myself as well as from Scott that we'll be presenting. Now, in order to help the audience understand uh, the perspective that I'm going to be presenting, and I guess I should have started my time, so I will know how much time I have, but uh, I would like to go ahead and put my first slide on the screen. I think I have it up, um, so let's see what's there. Let me check and see. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So you can go ahead and share that first slide if you have it. <clears throat> yes, it's up on the screen, William. Okay, uh, what I have is pretty much an overview uh, with some detail of the resurrection as I understand it in the Bible. And uh, I'll be defining some terms shortly because I think those are important uh, to do. But for now, uh, what I would like to say is that Resurrection, resurrection has to do with uh, covenants, the transition from one covenant to the other. And what you're looking on this, at on the screen, you see to the left here what I'm calling the body of Moses. And the body of Moses, of course, uh, could also be, it's just an expansion of the body of Adam as well. But the point is, from this perspective, what you're seeing is uh, the covenant that God made as far as the, the old covenant with Moses and um, the status of people under that covenant. And this is all related to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, what you're seeing here are what we're calling the dead ones. And the dead ones, defined in my proposition, are the Old Testament saints who were under that covenant. They died before the cross. And hence, you see the cross. There are some consequences of that on both sides of the cross, and we'll talk about them. When people talk about the physical body, they lump all the dead ones together and just talk about a mass of flesh coming out of the ground. But that's not what the text uh, discusses. That's not what the Bible discusses. You have passages, for example, in Romans chapter 5. Um, you could start with verse 12 for by uh, as by one man uh, sin entered the world and death by sin so that death passed upon all men because all sin and then if you will look at verse 14 it will say nevertheless death reigned from adam to moses those are federal heads those are corporate men and so what we're talking about are covenantal uh concepts related in those passages and then uh you'll see romans 5, 19, and 21 that talks about <clears throat> uh, particularly more where the law entered that the offense might abound. So we, when it talks about the offense of Adam and, and then the righteousness of Christ, then it will say more where the law entered that the offense ab uh, abounded. So the law gave strength to sin and thus further imprisoned them in bondage in that state. Um, that's also referred to in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56, when it talks about the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. It's the Torah. That's the William, I I'm just going to pause the your timer. There's uh, at least one person in the chat that's asking if you can go full screen by any chance with your slide. Might make it easier for people to okay, let, make out uh, the text. All right, hold on. Let me try. I know that some of the text is small let's see here i have a 
Yeah, I'm trying to see where it might say full screen. Oh, there we go. So full screen should be up there somewhere. But I can also make it larger on my end if there's an issue there. So I did just put it full screen on my end if if there's no full screen option for you, William. There's got to be one here. <laughs> Slideshow. Let's see. From current slide. Okay, let's try this. Uh, PowerPoint is just take your graphic card. Maybe not be. I don't know how it's going to look when I do it. Uh, you can tell me what that looks like. Well, that looks good. Yeah, that's really clear. Maybe at the bottom where it says stop sharing, you can click hide. And that way the, the bottom text won't be. Yeah, that looks great, William. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So as I was saying, you had those who were in the old covenant in that um, old covenant body, which I'll explain a little bit further in a moment, but they were under the old covenant and they died prior to the cross. And hence they are called the dead ones in first Corinthians 15. Now, because they lived under that old covenant, they were unable to extricate themselves from the consequences of trying to live by their own human agency. And hence, when they died, uh, they died in their sins from that perspective, because sin had not been redeemed through Christ. And hence, you have a text like Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 that says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the transgressions, which were under the first covenant, they who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And again, in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, it will tell you, starting with Abel, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. God, having provided something better for us that they, apart from us, shall not be made perfect. And being made perfect there is another uh, reference a word for the resurrection, just like Jesus said in Luke 13, uh, 33, the third day I shall be perfected. Now, to the right of the cross are those who obeyed the gospel as a result of its preaching on the day of Pentecost, Acts 3, um, Romans 6, etc. And therefore, they came to life in Christ after the cross, because Christ was the first fruit from the dead, or the first, uh, yes, the first fruit from the dead, from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And so when they died with Christ in baptism, as they did on Pentecost, and even as the Romans did, they died to sin and rose in a new state of life. Now, we're going to have a lot to say about that as we go. And the reason I say that is because according to first, uh, excuse me, according to Romans chapter six and verse 10, the Bible says that Christ in dying also died to sin. That's Romans chapter six and verse nine. So let me uh, get that and read it. The text says, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead dies no more, uh, death no longer has dominion over him for the death that he died. Now, notice this. He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus didn't just die a physical death and rise. There was something else working in his death. He died to sin, and that is the death that those who heard the gospel were dying with him as stated in Romans 6. And if you study that text carefully, it will tell you exactly that because it says they died to his death or they were buried or baptized into his death. Now, the other point on the chart shows that there was the, you have the Holy Spirit poured out at the day of Pentecost. And according to Micah 7, 15, the Holy Spirit would continue throughout what we call the second exodus, which based on the type of the old covenant was a 40 year period. So Micah says, according to the days of your coming out of Egypt, 
I will show wonders or uh, miraculous gifts. That's a parallel to Acts chapter 7 and verse 36. When Israel was being redeemed from Egypt in the uh, historical Exodus account, the scripture says he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. So we have two parallel uh, situations here, with Israel coming out of historical exodus, uh, or Egypt in the historical exodus, with miracles being shown for that 40-year transition from um, Egypt to the Promised Land, to Canaan. And we have the same thing in the New Testament, which deals with the true exile of Israel. And uh, we'll cover these passages that you see now. So as we said, Christ, um, they, uh, the living ones were also called first fruits. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, because they've died with Christ, because James 1, 18 says they were first fruits, and because um, they had the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, and they're called the firstborn ones, Hebrews 12 and verse 23, <clears throat> and Revelation 14, 4. Now, when they died, they didn't jump back on the other side of the cross and become a part of the dead ones. When they died, they had a different scenario. They fell asleep in Christ, and that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, they are called call those who have fallen asleep in Christ. There are some consequences, as you see in those arrows, for the most part. And by the way, another very important point in looking at the dead ones, if you look at the arrow here, this showed that Christ rose out of the dead ones. And that's why there are several arguments that he makes in the chapter relative to these dead ones. Uh, Dunny, I didn't turn my clock back on when we stopped it, so I don't know how much time I have, and I know I'm not going very fast. Uh, because no I worries. Want, I want people. Yeah, William, to you just hit the ten minute mark, so you oh, still great. got ten minutes. Great, great, great. Okay, and so when they're raised because they die to sin, unlike these dead saints, so these uh, dead ones, the Old Testament saints, they are able to live with Christ. And what does that mean? That means they're raised in Christ. They receive righteousness and, uh, you know, life through grace, etc., and they reign with Christ. Now, this was a process, a 40-year exodus process called the second exodus. And that's why we have the terms that are used in the Bible, like redemption, etc., uh, those terms are there. And in Luke 9 and verse 31, the Bible says, uh, uses the very term exodus when uh, Moses and Elijah spoke about Jesus' death. It said that they spoke about his decease. The word death in the English is the word exodus, or the word decease is the word exodus. And so Jesus, in dying, was making his exodus out the, of this old covenant into which he was born. He was born of a woman, but also born under the law, under the old covenant. So when he died, he died to that old covenant. And when he rose, he rose into the new covenant. But what was he doing here? As a high priest, he was bearing the sins of the world. But when he rose, he no longer bore those sins. That's the broader meaning of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, the process of delivering them out of Egypt, the true spiritual exile, which all of the other uh, types and shadows were prefiguring, was a 40-year period. That's why they had the gifts, the eschatological spirit poured out the miraculous work of the Spirit, for 40 years, and that consummated in 70 AD. By that time, also, the dead ones were raised, and 70 AD was therefore the end of that old covenant mode of being. And the kingdom, or the new covenant mode of being, which has no end, continues, and that's what's indicated by this arrow. Now, when we get to 1 Corinthians 15, I'll have reason to come back to this chart and explain why these arrows are here and how they work. But I want to go to the next slide, so let's see if I can get there. Now, this is basically a repeat of what I've just shown you, but has a bit more information to 
help the audience understand. And my appeal here is really to the audience. This was called the body of Moses. Jude 1 and verse 9 speaks of the body of Moses. It's a, ref a reference back to uh, Zechariah chapter 3, when there was a dispute over the body of Moses and whether or not Israel should be condemned. And Michael stood up and, and of course, um, protected them, saying that, look, you're, you're way too early in trying to condemn them. I'm not finished with this work. That's quite a paraphrase of what's going on, but I do refer you to go back there and look at it. Now, this is called the body of Moses, but this is a covenant body. The body is also called the house. It was a temple or a tabernacle of Moses or a tabernacle in which Moses served. And you get that from Hebrews chapter three, verses two and three. Now, one thing that the text says in Hebrews uh, three and two it says that this old covenant system was therefore a testimony, meaning that it foreshadowed everything that was to come later. He says, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses also was, uh, was faithful in all his house. So you have the body of Moses, you have the house of God, but Moses is operating as a servant in that under that old covenant. Now in 2 Corinthians 3, that system, that covenant system was called the ministration of death, but that's a covenantal ministration. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, here's a couple of uh, passages, verse 6 beginning, he says, who also made us, this is Paul speaking, sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter. This is called the letter. Uh, the old covenant system was called the letter, but of the spirit, which is the new covenant, for the letter kills, and that was the problem. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That's the difference between these two covenantal states. Now, it wasn't because there was fault in the covenant, which uh, we can read clearly from Romans 7, but Paul says, I'm the one who's carnal and sold under sin. In other words, it was the impossibility of human possibility to live according to that old covenant. Now, if you look at the bottom, you'll see both of these covenants promised life. But the shortcoming was not with the covenant on the left-hand side. It was with the people in the covenant who couldn't keep it perfectly. Because if you offended in one point, you were guilty of all. And the problem was, because of the blood of bulls and goats, it could not take away sin. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. And so what did people get under that old covenant system? They got condemnation. It was the natural body because they could only live according to their, their own strength and will and, and power. And once that failed them, that was it. And so therefore it was mortal in that sense because not only did they die under it, but that body was also dying. And we'll talk about that as necessary. And so it's called the body of corruption as well. And it was that in which they had the bondage of sin and death. Now, how did they enter that body? They entered through baptism. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 2, the Bible says for uh, all those, all the fathers who were uh, with Moses were under the cloud and under the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, et cetera. The, all right. Now, when you go to the right side, you see the body of Christ. This is called the ministration of life. Also from uh, Second Corinthians, but if the ministry of the of death was written and engraved on stones, which was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation, that's the one on the left, had glory, the ministry of righteousness, which is this one, exceeds much more in glory. So we're talking about a more glorious um, covenant. In this covenant, they had life, righteousness. It's the spiritual body, whereas this one is the natural and sometimes referred to as the fleshly. This is the one that is immortal and non-dying so that a person who comes into this actually receives that life. And it's also the state of incorruption. And here you have freedom from sin and death. How did they enter this body? They entered it 
through baptism. Now, it's called the body of Christ. It's called the house of God, 1 Timothy 3.15, the church, which is the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And house of God is just a reference to temple. So it's the temple. This is the one when Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. So there was a lot more going on with the resurrection of Christ than just his body coming out of the ground. He was building a new temple for existence for the people of God so that they could actually come into God's presence. Now, uh, so it's called the, uh, over here, it was called the ecclesia as well, or the church in the wilderness, Acts 7.38. The goal was for them to reach earthly Canaan or Jerusalem, which people are fighting over today, and all this killing and bombing of children and schools and churches and um, uh, genocide that's going on in the land of Israel. For those people who have this concept of resurrection and, uh, or, or rather, this Zionist um, uh, paradigm, this is because they don't understand this covenant relationship. But it was given in Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, whereas over on the right, this is the uh, the ecclesia or the assembly, the church, and it was in the wilderness as well, but in the new covenant wilderness. That's indicated in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. The goal was the heavenly Canaan or the heavenly Jerusalem. And One it minute. was through the new covenant. So hopefully... I've explained at least uh, and given you enough of information so that you can see that. And next, uh, this is just a, that's more of, um, of a repeat of that, but goes into a little bit more detail. But the next thing we'll do is we will um, define resurrection. And maybe he said I had a minute left, but let me just say here, the word resurrection is also a problem. It's from the word anastasis, a compound word which is ana, which means up or again, and stasis, or to sail the verb, which means to stand or to stand up again. Now, here's the point. The word does not tell you what the object is that is raised. That has to be supplied by context. So you can't just say resurrection and say it means to raise a body from the ground. That's untrue. That is false. It does not work. And I have more on that uh, definition later, but I think I'm out of time. And I want to uh, make sure that we don't go over. All right. Thank you. Thank you, William Bell. The gentleman, that wraps up our 40 minutes of opening statements, 20 minutes each. I do appreciate the work you both put into those opening presentations. And I appreciate the visuals as they are always helpful to myself and the audience. And so, okay, we're now moving into our rebuttals. We got lots of points on the table to engage and to rebut. And so, Scott, we're going to hand it back to you whenever you're ready. You have a 10 minute rebuttal. I'll give you a, a one minute warning at the nine minute mark. That way, you'll know to start winding things down. Fantastic. Can you go ahead and share my screen again, Donnie? Yes. <clears throat> oh. Wrong one. Let me uh, stop sharing that one. Let me go back over to the other one. I'm working on it here. Take your time. There it is. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. All right, we can go ahead and 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 start the time here. Appreciate William uh, your presentation there. Again, I'm going to just try to keep this this real simple, um, or as simple as I can, as we're as we're talking about resurrection, whether that is past or future. There is a sense when we're talking about resurrection. Remember, it's two stages. We find that supplied in various spots. First uh, Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. We also find it in Revelation chapter 20, where it's split up in Jesus's resurrection and the resurrection that comes after. We know that Jesus' resurrection did, in fact, occur in 30 AD. It, it was physical. He physically rose again from the grave. What happened before Christ? Um, were, 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 people, were people spiritually made alive? Well, the answer is no. I think William uh, talked about that as far as uh, they, were, they were alienated from, from God. They were alienated from God's life. And the, the whole of the Old Testament, the, 
the, the temple cult system really is to demonstrate what it's like to be reunified with God and ultimately what Jesus would do. It, it foreshadows. It's a foreshadowing. It's a, it's a type. And we see that those shadows and types are ultimately fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus comes. He lives a sinless life. He condemns sin in his own flesh. And as a result of his, his covenant justice, his faithfulness uh, to the old covenant, and pain for sin on the uh, on the cross, rising again from the grave, uh, we we now can have eternal life through His Spirit. Um, John chapter seven verse thirty nine says this. But He spake of the Spirit. This is kind of a parenthetical statement here, which they that uh, uh, which they that believe on Him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we know that prior to the the, the resurrection. Of Christ, the Holy Spirit wasn't given, at least in the redemptive sense that it is today, whereby people are born again. They're spiritually regenerated. That didn't happen. It happened after the fact. But notice what Jesus came came to do. So, so, so what happened? Uh, you know, William was talking about the Old Testament saints. You have all these Old Testament saints. They're spiritually alienated from God. You know, where are they? What happened to them? Lots of debate as far as church history and all that kind of stuff is, is what happened to those people. He made a reference that the resurrection applies to them, that the dead ones are those under the old covenant who are who are righteous and they died, but they were not yet risen with Christ. Ephesians chapter one, okay, kind of setting that stage. Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. It goes on, it says something very similar at the end, um, yeah, verse, verse 20 of chapter 1, uh, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heaven and places far above principality, power, and might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but that is in, which is in the world to come. And has put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In other words, his body fills both heaven and earth. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, it says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The point that I want you to see here is, is what Jesus Christ did. Not only was his, his death, burial, and resurrection efficacious spiritually for those who would call on Christ in the present or people that were contemporary to him, like Paul, but it was efficacious for those who were already dead and gone in the past. Ephesians chapter 4 quotes uh, a passage, and maybe it's from Psalms or something, but he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In Ephesians chapter 11, we have the great hall of faith where we have all of these different people who lived under the old covenant, and not just under the Mosaic covenant, but even prior to that, like Abraham and Noah and etc. Et and then in Ephesians chapter 12, it, it says, because remember, there's no chapter div uh, divisions or, or verse divisions in the original. He says, wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who, who are these cloud of witnesses? These cloud of witnesses that are that are that are watching. Who are these cloud of witnesses? Well, it's the people back in Hebrews chapter 11, all those Old Testament saints. In other words, those Old Testament saints were partakers of that first resurrection as well. They were seated with Christ in the heavens. That's why in Ephesians chapter 12, verses 22 through 24, he says, But you are come unto Mount Zion. That's present, by the way. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angel, uh, angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which were written in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. In other words, all of those Old Testament saints, the dead ones, were already in heaven with Christ. They've been, they've been redeemed. They've been bought with the price. Their spirits are in heaven awaiting what? Awaiting the resurrection of the dead. Awaiting the time when their own physical bodies would be raised from the grave. Uh, First Thessalonians. I, I want you to picture this because this is, this is kind of where the debate is, right? What is the second resurrection? What is it all about? My understanding from, from, from William's point of view is that the resurrection, the second stage, has to do with the dead ones, the, the, the ones that were under the old covenant, who he believes they were still, you know, they weren't in heaven, wherever they were. 
they weren't raised with Christ, they were still in the grave. So in other words, Paul is spiritually born again. He is raised with Christ. He is seated with Christ in the heavenlies. But people like Moses, well, they're still, they're, they're not. They're not in heaven. They're, they're in the grave. They're, they're somebody, they're somewhere, but they're not in heaven yet with Christ. And what I just tried to say is, well, the Bible just contradicts that. There's a great cloud of witnesses. Where are those great cloud of witnesses? In heaven with Christ, because they are now in Zion, in which we have come to as well. So you, you have the situation. If that's the, if that's the case, if those people are already raised in heaven with Christ, then, then what is the second resurrection all, all about? Because William's, William's argument is that the second resurrection has to do with the spirits of Old Testament saints. Go, well, you, know, you don't have to go. It's my preacher, preacher in me. First Thessalonians chapter number four. We get this, um, so in verse 30, it's a familiar passage. People often preach it at funerals. I know I have. He says this in verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, this is written somewhere, I don't know, in the 50s, maybe late 40s or something like that, but sometime after Christ has died. And he goes on, he says, he's telling these people, it's very practical. He says, you shouldn't sorrow as the pagans do regarding those who are asleep. In other words, regarding those who have died. And who knows that maybe there was a relative or someone of the Thessalonians who died just the year before, but they 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 were a believer in Jesus. Well, what happens to them? And he goes on and he says, Don't don't be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Now, William's gonna say those that are asleep are Old Testament saints. That's not the context here. But be that as it may, just go on and, and notice what it says here. He says in verse number 15, but this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, actually, I don't want to skip that. Look, look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Jesus returns with those saints who, who are asleep. The dead in Christ return with Christ. Christ doesn't return to receive them. They return with him. He goes on and he says, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, we, who's Paul talking about? You could say himself, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or precede them which are asleep. There's, a, there's an order of resurrection here. Now, is he talking about that first stage of resurrection? Well, no, because remember, Paul is already raised with Christ spiritually. He's, he's born again. He has received the spirit. He's seated with Christ in the heavens. He's coming to Mount Zion already. All, all of that is true of Paul. He goes on and he says, Though uh, um, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not present, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. And notice who, 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 who rises first. The seconds. dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, hold on, we're getting something backwards here. If the dead in Christ rise first, right? It, but Paul has already risen with Christ spiritually. He's already in heaven. But if, if, if the argument is being made that the dead in Christ are those who are still waiting to get into heaven, even though Paul is already there, Paul says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. He gives, he, it's very clear the order of resurrection. It's the dead in Christ first. And then we which are alive and remain. To, to suggest that these, these dead Time. ones aren't even in heaven before 70 AD. And that they're being raised spiritually. Even though Paul and, and the apostles are already raised with, with, uh, you know, with Christ in heaven already. It's, it's backwards. It turns it on, it on its head. Um, uh, see if I can't dig into that later on. I don't know my my time is up. So thank you. Okay, Scott, thank you very much for that first rebuttal. First rebuttal for our guest tonight is 10 minutes. And so now we're going to hand it over to William. William, whenever you're ready, you also have 10 minutes for your first rebuttal. And the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. I'm still trying to learn how to navigate this. 
All right. Um, first, let me say that um, Scott keeps talking about the order of the resurrection. And he is totally 180 degrees different from what Paul said about it. So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the verse is 46. Now notice what Scott is arguing. He's arguing first the spiritual, then the natural. You get your spiritual resurrection first, and then you get your physical body resurrection second. You get That's the last thing that you get. Well, that's not what Paul said. So we'll let scripture uh, resolve this for us, hopefully. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the verse is 46. The scripture says, first, the natural. So unless the natural to Scott equals the spiritual, he's got a problem. Verse 45, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. How does Scott have it? The spiritual is first, and after that, the natural. That shows that his resurrection paradigm doesn't fit 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Secondly, He's arguing for a consummated process. When I laid out very carefully and deliberately the Old Testament Exodus. Now, if he can tell us that the Exodus was consummated at the time of the cross or when Jesus rose from the dead and say that was the completion of the Exodus for the church, it happened in less than than um, uh, 40 years, then maybe he has a point. And I'll listen to that when he has it. But let's go to some passages and see. One of the texts that he quoted was Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans 6, and I have a chart for that. Um, let's see if I can find it. This this thing really confuses me. First of all, let's, let's go to this chart. Um, I'm going to show this chart. Um, Let's see, how do I get it up? <laughs> View the screen. I haven't been using this this way for a long time. So, all right. What Scott does is he ignores the textual um, evidence for these passages. For example, the one that he's citing in Ephesians 2 uh, about they were raised up and made to sit together. Um, I'll show you some others that he's doing. But the aorist, and particularly the constitutive aorist, and I'll, I'll read this. This says, the use of the aorist contemplates action in its entirety. Even though it's stated as past action, it's viewing the action as a whole. Let me give you one example. In John chapter 1, verse 14, when it says, and the word uh, uh, tabernacled among us. The word was made flesh and tabernacle among us. Well, that's the aorist. It's stated as though it's past, but it covers the entire ministry of Christ. You don't necessarily see that unless you think about it. That's the entire ministry of Christ. Same thing in John chapter two, when Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The temple was being built or had been in building for 46 years, but that's all encompassed in that one statement. So when the Bible talks about they have been raised up together and made to sit, that's an aorist in that text, and it's encompassing the entirety of the, enti of, of the Exodus, not just what happened at the cross. And I will uh, demonstrate that. Uh, but what I want to go to before, because he spent a lot of time on 1 Timothy chapter 2, and this would be another example. I don't think I have this scripture on the screen. Uh, I, let me see if I can um, put it up and have you share so we can uh, take a look at it. But anyway, uh, before we get there, let me mention it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he went there to say that the resurrection, they were saying that the resurrection was passed already. And that anybody who's teaching that is, is um uh, overthrowing the faith of some. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly 
the resurrection that Scott is affirming tonight. He's affirming a resurrection that was passed already at the time that text was written, which he admitted was 67 AD. Now, here's the point. One thing that our premise says is that these things were fulfilled at the time that the temple was destroyed. That's Luke 21, uh, 20 through 22, and also Matthew 24 and verse 3. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your parousia and of the end of the age? And Jesus responded to them, uh, to their question, when he had told them, there's not one stone here that shall not be uh, thrown down, or that is upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then in verse 34, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. In Luke 21, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now, in First Timothy, this is a temple concept. This is t The temple is a part of this um, text. But first thing, notice this is not the doctrine that the apostles taught. If you look in 2 Timothy 2, verse 11, the text says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with Christ, now, is that physical death? I don't think Scott will affirm that, but the text says they had died with Christ. So the life in the text has to be antithetical to the death that is mentioned. If we died with Christ, we shall also live with him. If we endure we shall also reign with him. If he deny us, uh, he will also deny us. Now, if you go to chapter four, you will see that Paul affirmed a resurrection that was future, which is contrary to what Hymenaeus and Philetus taught, but he affirmed that it was about to occur. So he says in verse one, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. As a matter of fact, that's what he said about all the resurrection texts in the scriptures, Acts 24, 14 and 15. When they were trying to say that Paul taught things contrary to the law, he says they can't prove that. He said, but this I say that according to the way which they call heresy, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. So Paul was affirming a resurrection after the cross that was about to occur. Now he says the spiritual had already taken place, which is out of the order of 1 Corinthians 15. Then I'd like for him to tell us whether the physical body resurrection that he calls the second resurrection took place in a short time after um, Paul wrote that or Paul stated that in Acts 24, or that he wrote it in 2 Timothy chapter 4 in 67 AD. Were they about to experience a physical body resurrection? Scott says, no. He says it's still to come even today. That's because he does not believe or accept these time statements relative to the resurrection of the dead. Even in the text that he cites in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that text says, we who are alive and remain. Now, I recall listening to him in one of his debates talk about audience relevance, and he was trying to emphasize to some of his comrades about why they need to pay attention to some of the arguments that the preterists make. Scott, are you going to pay attention to First um, uh, Thessalonians 4, verse 15 and 17 that says, we who are alive, were you in the audience at the time that text was written? That was written to people in the first century. Paul is saying, we who are alive and remain for how long? Until the coming of the Lord, until the parousia. Where are they? Prove tonight that they are still around. As a matter of fact, in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Paul said, we shall not all sleep. I know Scott takes that meaning to die. Physical death. So what did Paul say? We, Corinthians, and he admitted in the debate with Stacey Tuberville, that those were the Corinthians. He, he, he tried to make it himself as well later. I have the video clip if we need to show it. But he said, that's the Corinthians. Well, where are they? Is that the Corinthians that were in the first century that Paul preached to when he said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not, all, not only would the dead be raised, but the living would be changed 
in that same first century time frame. That's my time. William, thank you so much for that 10 minute rebuttal. That concludes our first round of rebuttals. Excellent debate so far, gentlemen. We have a fantastic audience that is very much engaged in this event. And so to the audience, I am all caught up on questions. I appreciate the support and all of the questions, the well thought out questions that are coming in. Okay, William and Scott, we're now moving into our second rebuttal. And for our second rebuttal, we have another 10 minutes on the clock. Therefore, Scott, whenever you're ready, please let me know. And you have 10 minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, let me, uh, Donnie, go ahead and share that screen again, if you okay. would, please. Perfect. I think William, I don't know. I, I, I had a hard time getting a, a straight answer. I don't know how many, how many resurrections William thinks that there is. I've laid out the proposal here that there, there's, there's two, there's, there's two stages. Um, there is the first in which Christ raises. Christ is the first fruits. The text in First Corinthians is really clear on that. Um, Christ the first fruits, then they that are Christ at his coming. Um, every person, and I think William would would agree, and I'm and trying to just, you know put us in the time frame between 30 and 70 AD when he thinks things were consummated. A believer who was alive at that time, right? They well, what happened to them when when they received Christ? They were they were spiritually regenerated. They were they, they were born again. That is the spiritual. That is that is that is first. Um, and 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 certainly that's um, that's the argument. Yes, the spiritual is is first. We're going to address that here in First Corinthians fifteen as far as uh, his objection to that. But a person is spiritually born again by virtue of their relationship with Christ. In Christ, they died. In Christ, they, they were buried. And in Christ, they were raised from the grave. They share in the identity of Christ. So I, Paul, in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, in the body, I live by the faith or the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and, and gave himself for me. So, so Paul and the apostles, um, all of these people were spiritually reborn. They were, they were, they were seated with Christ in heaven, as Ephesians 2 mentions and other texts as well. They had come into Mount Zion, which we look there again, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. That's in the present text, right? When, when was the atonement made? Well, the atonement was made at the cross. Uh, uh, Romans uh, 5 and 6, um, it really, really all the way through chapter 8. And talk about that as far as the Christ is our atonement. They had received the atonement. They were forgiven. And they were now seated with Christ in heaven. But what about the Old Testament saints? So, so that's a question because that's what, that's what the second stage that I presented here, which I propose is a actual bodily resurrection, which, yes, the writings of Paul talk about a resurrection that's going to happen in the future. That's going to affect people like Paul himself. In, in, in fact, let me just go over there. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, let's, let's address some of these things that uh, <clears throat> William brought up. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first of all, verse 44, verse 45. It is, it is sown a natural body. It has raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last, uh, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, if we go back in the text earlier, it's going to give an example of seeds and how a seed, a, a bare grain, a naked seed is buried in the ground and God gives it a body as he sees fit, something that is clothed. And it, it, it doesn't go into the ground the same way uh, or it doesn't, it doesn't uh, it isn't raised, it doesn't receive the body the same way that it goes into its ground. It, there's there's continuity, but there's discontinuity. It's it's similar, but it's 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 dissimilar. And and we find the perfect example of that, of course, in Jesus's own resurrection. He went into the grave, 
And then he came out of the grave. And there's continuity because he had the same body, sort of. He still had the nail prints in his arm and in his side. And yet this body that Jesus had after the cross could appear and disappear like that. It could be disguised somehow to where the, the, the people on the road to Emmaus couldn't recognize Jesus. Uh, he, he could apparently go through walls um, being present with the, with the believers just, just all of a sudden. In other words, there was some, there was some discontinuity between Jesus' old body and his, and his raised body. But it was still a physical body. And that's the idea. The, the word body here is soma. It, it is something material. It is something physical. And when we look at verse 44 and verse 45, there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. We can get more into the particulars of this language here. But what we have is a, a predicative adjective, I believe is what it is, which isn't necessarily describing the quality. It, it's describing more, more place or origin. In other words, what we have was, is, is uh, the soma, a body. We have a soulish body, a pneumatic or a, 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 a psychicose. A soulish body, right? Which, interestingly, in, in other Greek literature around that time, if someone wanted to talk about being a, a disembodied spirit or something like that, they would use psychikos, soulish. But here, psychikos is actually, you know, it's being used not to talk about an immortal or, or an immaterial body, but actually an, an, a natural body, a soulish body. In other words, a body that is energized by the soul. And that's held in contrary to what? To a, a spiritual body, a pneumaticos. In other words, it's not a, not a body that is comprised of spirit, but as a body that is energized by spirit. He, he's, he's talking about the old natural man in the flesh. What, what drove us? Well, ourselves, our, our psyche, we're our, our soul, soulish. Well, what drives the resurrected body? The spirit, just as it was with Jesus's body. So, yes, there, you know, we talk about a two part kind of a resurrection in which all those who are born again, they are raised spiritually. They take part in that in Jesus's resurrection. Therefore, they have this this spiritual body. But it's the physical body that they're waiting for later on. Now, now Paul couldn't be any more clear on this. Particularly when we look at verses um, 50 down through like 55. So verse 50 says, Now I say then, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In the context, what is he talking about? These flesh and blood bo bodies. That's why they have to be changed. It has to be changed into something else, into an immortal body. Uh, so flesh and blood, corruptible man as we exist right now, it has to be changed. Which is what he says in verse 51. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we will not all physically die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. The dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, there's that audience relevancy that, that William was talking about. We shall be changed. Well, who is we? Well, Paul includes himself among those. He's already changed, though. But he's saying we shall be. In other words, future. Well, what kind of future change does Paul need? Paul is already raised with Christ. He's already seated with Christ in the heavens. If if spiritual resurrection, if if, if that if that's all that it is, Paul's already got it. He doesn't need anything else. But that's not what Paul says. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we shall be changed. In other words, it's the living, the, the, the dead are going to be raised, that's for sure. But what about those who are still alive when Jesus comes? Will they have to die too in order to be raised? No. Paul says that they will be changed in a moment and a twinkling of an eye. We shall be changed. He goes on, he says, verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, this hasn't happened yet for Paul. Now, Paul is already saved. Paul is spiritually born again. Paul is sitting, sitting with Christ in the heavens. Whenever this was written, and if that's it, if Paul's attained, which he goes on and says elsewhere that he hasn't, but if, but if Paul's attained, if, he is, is, if he's got the resurrection, if, if that's all there is to it, then he could already say death is swallowed up in victory. But that's not what Paul says. Paul goes, he's clear, verse uh, 54, when this 
corruptible shall put on incorruption. So in other words, it hasn't happened yet for Paul. Even though he's saved, he's spiritually born again, he's spiritually raised with Christ, he's in heaven with Christ. But he says, when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past. The One in minute. other words, this, this, this saying hasn't been brought the past yet. Death is swallowed up in victory. It wasn't true yet for Paul in his age, even though he was already in Christ. When will that happen? It happens at the second resurrection. When Paul's own body is raised, when, when, when the sin that, was, that, is, that, that plagues us, when, it, when it's finally done away, when the body is, is raised up in an incorruptible way and the spirit and body reunite to be on a renewed earth, then shall be brought to pass the same death is swallowed up in victory. This is why death is the final enemy. This hadn't happened yet for Paul, even though he was apparently he, he was already born again. He has everything that, that David says that he should have had, but death wasn't swallowed up in victory yet for Paul. That's a problem. It's an inconsistency. This is what Five I'm saying. seconds. What full preterism does is it takes what was accomplished in 30 AD and it puts it in 70 AD. It was already accomplished in 30 AD, the spiritual aspects of this. Okay, gentlemen, I appreciate the engaging debate so far. That now concludes opening statements. We had 20 minutes for opening statements, two rounds of rebuttals, and so 20 minutes each. And we're now jumping into our cross-exam for tonight's debate. Did, oh, yes, actually, uh, William, William Bell, has a, yep, you got your 10-minute yep. rebuttal. So I spoke too soon. One more rebuttal and then cross-exam. So, William, you have uh, 10 minutes on the clock. And so whenever you're ready, apologies, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, wow. Let's see here. If you did need a sh uh, screen share, we can certainly yeah, do that me, as well. Give me just a moment. Um, All right, uh, you can, is, is my screen being shared? Yes. All right. Uh, first, Scott's defining the resurrection totally different from the way the Bible defines it. So I'd like for him to find a text that tells us exactly what the resurrection is. Here's one that I have. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I bet he will tell you that Jesus is the life. He'll tell you that he's the living water. I don't think he believes that the living water is uh, H2O. He'll tell you that he's the light of the world and the bread from heaven. All of which are spiritual. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say I'm two resurrections, but that's what Scott is affirming. The Bible says there is but one hope, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. So where does he get to? And he's violating his concept of already but not yet. What does already but not yet mean, Scott? If you're saying it's the already but not yet, show me the already of physical resurrection. For you to have a valid argument on the already but not yet, there has to be some already of the physical resurrection. So where are the saints participating in it physically for it to be already so they can get the not yet of it later? You got two resurrections going on. You have a spiritual resurrection and then uh, first, which is contrary to what Paul said, I repeat again, 1546, and then you got a natural resurrection later. The difference between the natural man and the spiritual man is not biology. It's not physicality. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, the scripture says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. You have him receiving it, apparently, either in the beginning or at the end. Take your pick. Then you talked about corruption and incorruption. Well, how, how about this one? In 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, the scripture says that they had been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So they have 
in corruption. But if you want to talk about, see, that's why I talked about the heiress. If you want to talk about death, how about 2 Timothy 1 and verse 10 that says that he has abolished death or disannulled death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel? That's an already, isn't it, Scott? So why are we even talking about death if your premise is true? Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, the text doesn't say the last enemy that shall be or will be destroyed is death. When you look at the Greek, it's a present active indicative. It says the last enemy being destroyed is death. So death was in a process of being destroyed. That's why I told you, you can't take the aorist and ignore the fact that it covers the entirety of the time. Paul wasn't contradicting himself when he said death had been destroyed. Which death was it that was disannulled in 2 Timothy 1.10? Was it spiritual or was it physical? And which one is it that was still being put away? Then you admit it that Paul didn't have it, but <laughs> which death was Paul participating in in Philippians chapter 3, verse uh 10, let's start there, in, or maybe verse 9. He says that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Not as though, uh, let's see, I think I missed a, a text in there somewhere. Let me make sure I, I put it in there. Uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection out from the dead. That's the word ex anastasin. That's not a different resurrection. It's the same one resurrection in Christ. But the difference is Paul is participating in resurrection on a different plane than were the dead ones. He says, but I press on that I may lay hold for that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Now, why did he say that? Because the process was ongoing, just like the process of disannulling death was ongoing. The process of bringing in the life was ongoing until it reached its consummation. In Philippians 1, verse 5 and 6, he says, he, uh, I get two scriptures confused. Uh, verse 5, he says, for this for your fellowship in the gospel, he said, I thank my God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, now was that the physical one, uh, Scott, or was that the spiritual one? Whichever one it was, he was going to complete that work. We'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I think you admitted that in the questions that you gave me in Romans 13, 11 and 12, when uh, Paul said that um, to that it was now the hour to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Well, that's the same salvation that they already had. It was about to be consummated. And he, he tells them to put on Christ. Well, wait a minute. I thought they had put on Christ in baptism. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Romans chapter 6. Um, let's see. He talked about the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews. Well, look, Paul, the writer had just argued they all died in faith, not having received the promise. Hebrews 11.34 says many of them were tortured, et cetera, and uh, they refused to be brought back to life again so they could have a better resurrection. They weren't looking for a physical one. And uh, let's see, uh, what's the next text I wanted to uh, look at? Now, he's still trying to wiggle himself into 1 Thessalonians 4. He's like, yeah, it included Paul. Well, the text says those who were then living would not all die. They would remain till the coming of the Lord. I'm challenging you to show us where they are. He said they would not die, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. They're all dead now. So did Christ lie? That's what a lot of the skeptics say, That which is the reason they won't accept the gospel, because they said Jesus lied because he said he was coming in their generation. He was coming before some of them died. He was coming before they all fell asleep. And they cite the very text that we're talking about. The reason Paul said that he had not 
put on the immortality was because the process wasn't completed. He didn't say that he hadn't put it on because in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 49, that text says, as we bore the image of the earthy, that's a past tense there. It's either a perfect or an error. I have to go back and double check. But the point is, if that's the physical, they've already put it off. Because that was the image of the earthy. That's what you're arguing for, the physical body. But he says, we shall bear, and the word shall bear is incorrect as well. You have to look at all the evidence from the manuscripts. They've got two faulty manuscripts that renders for uh, for as a future. But the weighty evidence of the manuscripts show it as an aorist subjunctive, which means that the saints are participating in their process of resurrection and that it's ongoing so that they had at some time in the past engaged in that resurrection that was being completed, the one that you claim is future. If you want more evidence on that, look up, I think, pages 756 in R.T. France's First Corinthians in the uh, New International Commentary, and we have more evidence for that that we can submit. But that text is showing that they had to participate in their own resurrection. How can a dead man do that, a physically dead man? And that was the resurrection that was being fulfilled. And then um, in 1 Corinthians 15, why? Paul said, because the sting of death was sin and the strength of sin was the law. Why was the law still the strength of sin after you say it was done away at the cross? That doesn't make very much sense. That shows you that the law and the prophets weren't fulfilled. Jesus said not one jot or tittle could pass till all were fulfilled. And when you go to Hebrews and you talk about um, they were the firstborn ones already sharing in that, well, Hebrews 9, 8 and 9 says they could not enter into the holiest of all until, uh, or as long as, the first tabernacle was standing. When you go to Revelation 15, it was not until the seven plagues of the wrath of God was completed that the uh, tabernacle was opened in heaven that they had access to. And that's why he's exhorting them to enter in. It's a process of an already, but not yet. You see, when I say already, but not yet, I mean, whatever you have started already, you finished. We have started a debate tonight. That's the already. When we finish, will we be in a physical one or something different than the one we're in now? No, we'll be in the same one when we finish it. I guess it's my time. Okay, William, that's 10 minutes on the dot. I appreciate it. Uh, Gentlemen, good job so far. I appreciate the comprehensive nature of this debate. It's an important topic. It's a big topic. And so we've, for real this time, concluded our openings in two rebuttals, two rebuttals each. 20 minutes each. And so now we're moving into everybody's favorite part of these debates, the cross exam, where we can directly engage each other. We can ask each other questions and discuss the points. Now, since what we're doing is a strict cross exam rather than a free flowing discussion, let's do our best to ask our questions in a timely manner and then allow each other to answer sufficiently. But the one answering making sure to do their best to stay on point, not taking up too much time. Okay, so let's do this. Since William Bell just ended with his rebuttal, Scott, you're going to get the first 25 minutes to lead the way in questions. The floor is yours. Go ahead. All right, very good. Thanks, William. Uh, First question, when was the atonement? When did that take place? According to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 9, the atonement was a process where the high priest uh, made the offering, went into the tabernacle, and then in order for that process to be completed, he had to come out of the uh, tabernacle. That's what you have typified in um, Hebrews chapter 9 that talks about the two compartments of the temple, uh, the heavenly part and the earthly part, where the high priest went alone um, into the second part once a year. And so when Jesus, when the text says uh, Christ died, that he, uh, in order to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, then you have verse 28 that said he would appear 
And of, of course, the text reads a second time, but that's the completion of that process. So we have um, not just him going into the temple, but we have his appearing, which would be the time of the second coming. And that's what people miss about the coming of the Lord, that it's Christ in his priestly work that he's doing. Okay. And so that is, just yeah, to, go ahead. Just to cl clarify here. So you believe the, the, the atonement began in 30 AD and was a process that the atonement wasn't complete until 70 AD. Is that correct? That's correct. You're saying. Okay. So, okay, go ahead. So, hold on. Uh, so in Romans chapter five and verse 10, um, <clears throat> sorry, verse 11. And not only so, but we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Had they received the atonement? And, and, and Romans was written, I don't know, 57 AD. Did they, re did they receive the atonement in 57 AD? I think you're dealing with the same words that I've talked about tonight, Scott, and that is the aorist in those passages. So when it says they have received so, the atonement, you've got to understand that that's the beginning of the process. Now, let's look at it this way. All right. You, you're arguing that the atonement was the Passover, right? And if that's what you're arguing, then let's talk about the Passover so that you understand what I'm saying. The Passover. I, I, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. That's not, okay. not, not, not the question. That's not where I'm going. All right. All right. I, I believe the atonement was made at the cross. Um. Uh, m most certainly, Jesus shed His blood for our sins, and we have received the atonement. So when Paul is is speaking in those present, and I now I have to look back there, but I thought it was present perfect. We have received the atonement. Same thing with with Hebrews chapter eleven, right? I mean, when when was the veil torn? Well, the veil was torn, not in 70 AD, but 30 AD. Um, we, we now have, you know, we can come to Christ. Now, are you asking me or rather. are you going to tell me what the I, answers are? Or, or I'm, you just, I'm, I'm, you're I'm setting saying, up your question. It, okay, go ahead. There, yeah. Uh, we, uh, so Hebrews there, you know, they, they have now come to the Father through a new and living way, which he had made for them. When, when did, so, so on that, when did Jesus gain access to heaven for us when did that occur all right when jesus gained access in terms of his going into the most holy place for us that for us of course he's doing it he he did it for if you want to talk even more literally and specific he's he's dealing with those in the first century because that's the process that's when uh, taking place what when? i'm saying is when he entered into uh, the most holy place at his ascension. But what he's doing there is he's preparing the place for others to enter. Oh, okay. Have, have they entered? And so in Hebrews and verse number or chapter number 10 and verse 19 and 20, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated through us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance. Were they able to do that during that time? Well, look at Prior that's to 70 AD? A, that's an exhortation. He said, let us draw near. That means they're in the process of coming, just like in Hebrews 4.16. He says, let us come boldly. Why is it that they so wait, are not able? Hold on a second. Why is it that they're not able to come into the most holy place? in a consummated state. It's because the first tabernacle was still standing. That's Hebrews chapter nine, eight and nine. Maybe you should read those verses and read them with the, the verb being the present tense. The way into the holiest of all is not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle is standing, while it still has a covenantal standing. So it had to be removed wanted, in order for that access. Eat. So you don't, you don't think that they had access say in 55 AD? They didn't have access to heaven. They had access through the spirit, but the goal was not through the spirit. The, the, the goal was Christ himself. That's why in Colossians 1 27, the text says Christ in you, the hope of glory, the work of the spirit was right. the time of the absence of Christ. That's uh, John chapter 16. If I do not go away, the spirit will not come to you. And where was he going to the father's house to do what? To prepare right. the place. It, didn't didn't Jesus say that where I am there you may be also? I mean, that's, so that's so where so 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 I'm just so let me set this up here. Paul very clearly through, throughout his epistles talks about being in Christ, right? They were in Christ. 
such that we were seated with Christ in heaven. But you're saying that that actually wasn't the case. They weren't that that. No, that's not that what I'm saying. saying they, they, they're not really there. The access that's, hasn't been made yet for heaven for them, right? I'm saying to you, that statement is an already statement. Notice if you read chapter uh, 2, verses 19 and 20, it says this was a habitation of God through the Spirit. What Spirit? The eschatological Spirit poured out according to Joel that was there until the day of the Lord for 40 years until the coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, Micah 7, 15. What God was doing in is Hebrews, he wanted, uh, uh, go ahead. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, where it says, but you are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable com company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all and the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things of Abel. I mean, did did believers in say 67 AD were did they actually did they come into Mount Zion or is that future for them? Because Paul Paul clearly it, it's it's his encouragement. You have come to Mount Zion, right? Is, I is understand through the I the new and living on. way that Jesus made for them. Again, you're dealing with the already but not yet, and you're trying to force it. L let me give you a couple of passages so that you can understand. All right, you talked about Christ and his body. And uh, that it was a physical body when it rose from the dead. They touched it, et cetera. He could walk through walls and all of that stuff. Well, he could walk on water before that. But in 1 John 3, 22, uh, or 1 John 3, 2, he says, it has not yet appeared what we shall be like. For when he uh, appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, in 1 John 1, it says they touched, handled, uh, uh, looked upon, and saw the physical body of Christ when he rose from the dead, which he said was a flesh and bone body and not a spirit. And uh, so they saw all of that. So why is that the body of the resurrection? And if it had not yet appeared, then there had to be something other than what they had already. And he was going to bring that to consummation. Now, here's my question. Well, I can't ask that question yet. But anyway, yeah, uh, that's yeah. the point. Go I'll ahead. I'll let you answer those. those yeah. So let's, let's yeah. Y you mentioned First John 3, 2, right? Beloved, yes. now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we shall know, uh, but we shall know that um, when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. What's the difference? I, I guess, what is the difference between, um, you know, he says, we now are the sons of God, but it doesn't yet appear. So what is, what, what happens after, how, how can someone tell, or maybe even, you know, asking the context of today, can someone tell that you are a son of God? And how is that different from somebody in, say, 55 AD who, who claims the same faith? How well, can they you tell could, someone's the son of God? They couldn't really do that with Paul. Remember, they wanted to kill him, not knowing that he had been baptized. So you couldn't just look at him and tell right. he was a Jew just like all of the rest of the people. But he had right. obeyed the gospel. What's now, the wait, hold, hold on a second. One of the differences was the destruction of Jerusalem was the last sign that God gave in order to demonstrate who were the true sons of God. So when that temple failed, it separated those who were in the flesh, demonstrated that they were not the ones to inherit the promise of God and confirmed those who were the saints. Before that happened, he gave to them the spirit so that they could determine that they were the sons of God. That's what Romans 8 says. For as many as are led by the Spirit was, of God, they are the sons of God. Yeah. Now, you asked me the question. You got to let me answer it. Well, well, you gave me, you gave me the answer. I'm trying to think, how, how is that any different? How is that any different what from today? What do you mean? Today? It's different. Because, be, well, let's see. Let's see. If you don't think it's different, here, tell, here's... How can I tell? So so let me... Just, you have I'll, to... I'll Scott, clarify this. you have to read I'll the scriptures. Answer. You have to oh, hold on. go ahead. So, go so ahead. let's say let's say I have an unsaved cousin, right, right next to me, just imaginary, right? How can you tell the difference between if I if who is the son of God or not? How how can you tell that? Because that's what it's talking about, right? He says, "Now are we the sons of God," but it does not yet appear that way. But we know that you know when he comes, we shall be like him first. We shall see him as he is. So there's a difference after he comes. You'll be able to tell. Who's a son of God and who isn't? And if we're living in that day, then we should be able to tell manifestly. We should be able to say, that's a son of God. That's not a son of God. How can we tell? How is that manifest today? 
Well, the, the, the point of the text is from the first century perspective. And the way that they were able to tell in the first century prior to the destruction of the temple was through the miraculous gifts. That's Galatians chapter three. He, he asked them the question uh, when he says, um, uh, what is that? Galatians three. And I've already given you Galatians four and, Gal and, and Romans eight. But he says this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain, therefore, if it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you, now watch this, and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? When you look at 1 Corinthians 2.14 and Jude, I think it's verse 18 or 19, he says what separated them, what distinguished them was the spirit. He says the, the, okay. those who were the natural so, men. Hold, so, so Scott, you I, keep I, I interrupting give, I give me. Saying, I don't know. I know, but I'm, I'm okay. Let's you do, can I, do this during right, your time. Go too. I, let me, I, I got your answer. I just, I'm, I'm trying to keep this moving along so we okay. can get into the, to the, to the meat here. So someone in 69 AD, you're telling me has the spirit, right? And, and apparently you can tell that they're sons of God by the spirit. But then Jesus comes in 70 AD, right? And I, I'm, I think it's your understanding that they don't have the spirit beyond 70 AD. But, but here the text is saying, he, he says, beloved, now are we the sons of God? If you believe this is a pre-70 uh, AD text, right? He says, now we're the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But it shall be apparent after he comes, right? So I understand you can tell the difference between a son of God, someone who has the spirit and does miraculous things before 78 and who doesn't, all right? Um, sure, but that's, that's, doesn't, that doesn't fit here because he's talking about after Christ comes, you'll be able to tell that person's a son of God. But you don't believe that people have the spirit beyond 70 AD, is that right? No, that's not correct. What I believe is this. I believe that the miraculous measure of the spirit, as I pointed out when I first made my presentation, had to do with the second exodus. As he said in Acts 7, 36, for those in the in the wilderness and coming out of Egypt, uh, they performed those miracles for 40 years. And with um, Micah 7, 15, when he was talking about the second exodus, he says that I will show them wonders for 40 years. You can uh, There are translations that will say miraculous or wonderful things or marvelous things or whatever, yeah. but that's a reference to that. And that would continue to Christ. Now, having miracles... But they didn't do that after 70 AD, though, right? No, so, no they didn't so have no miracles. miracles after seven... Okay, so how could someone oh. tell that they were a son of God or not? Okay. Because that's when you say Scott, Christ comes. All right. So let how me, can let you me, tell? Let me answer. When you go back and study the Old Covenant, and you study Exodus with the plagues, you study Ezekiel uh, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, and you study Isaiah and Jeremiah, God always used some natural event. For example, when he would tell them, when I do this thing, then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, what you had in the New Testament were two people who claimed to be the sons of Abraham. Well, one way you tell is by their fruit. That's one thing. And we can look at people's fruit and tell. You can look at what they teach and tell. But one uh, thing was the event that God would give that when he said, when I do this thing, then you will know that I am the Lord. That's how he revealed himself to Pharaoh. That's how he revealed himself to the unbelieving Jews. And that's what he was doing in the first century. When that temple failed, but you don't think, say, hold, on, hold on a second. When that temple failed, say, you don't think the believers knew that they had been confirmed as sons of God? You can tell today that, because, Scott, you can tell yeah, today if somebody's yeah. If if somebody, you may not be able to tell everybody, but you can tell today because I know that you don't believe that the Zionists are Israel. And you don't believe that That's anybody. Not, hold, hold on a second. This is talking about individual believers, right? You should be able to tell. If That's Jesus talking about come, a should, body of believers. You should be able to tell who's a, who's a, who's a believer and who isn't. Because he says, now are we the sons of God? It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that 
when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, I've so, answered the question several I, well, times so for I, you. You just don't right, like well, my answer. That, that's fine. So, so we'll move on. So, let I, me give you. Let no me give you. Hold on. Let me give you one more text. Let me give you one more text so you understand. See, you're talking about things in the spiritual realm, and you're trying to see them with your physical eyes. The Bible says you have eyes of understanding. He's Ephesians. Talking, hold on. Hold on a second. Hold on, Scott. Let me answer real quickly. I'm going to be. I'm going to be very brief. Um. Um. Ephesians 1.18 talks about seeing with the eyes of your understanding. Now, here's the text for you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, the scripture says, for you died. Now, could you look at a person in the first century, according to this text, and tell them that they had died? Could you see that they had died? You couldn't. Because that's spiritual and you know it. Then he says, watch, right. and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What life was hidden with it's them? Clear. You've already admitted that it All was right. their spiritual life. All right. And if it was their it's spiritual clear. life, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What way were they going to appear? To be, Spiritually, to be clear, not to be physically. Clear, you think it's all spiritual. I believe that there is a physical aspect in which that's what First John 3 is talking about. I know what and you, I don't know how you tell the I don't know how you tell the difference between a believer today or not. You, you can't because it's not visibly manifest, which John says one day it will be. All right, moving on to a different question here. Uh, what is, you don't believe that there was, there was a resurrection prior to, prior to Christ, correct? What kind of resurrection are you talking about? There were physical resurrections all through the Old Testament. Or at least uh, there are a few of them. Named do you believe that there was, do you believe that there was life after death prior to the cross? No, not in the sense of the eschatological life of the age, because the age hadn't come. Wait that doesn't on. come how until did, Christ how Moses, dies. How did Moses and Elijah end up in the Mount of Transfiguration? Because were that they was in a resurrected form? Or that what, what's was, going on there? That was a vision. It was a vision. And it was prefiguring what would happen in the time of the end. But it wasn't the time of the I end. See. Now Anything again, if you if you argue, kind of stuff? if no, it's not smoke and mirrors. If you argue that they already the have it, then you have then what you have is you have them being raised before Christ even dies. <clears throat> How'd that work? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing that. I'm just trying to figure out what you think That's what that was. Like so you think you think it was an apparition? It was. It was nothing more than an apparition. Moses and Elijah weren't actually there. I believe they were there. I believe it was a vision of the parousia, but the scripture says in the Hebrews 11, the text that you've quoted several times, they all died in faith, not having received the promise. All right. So, so, so did so they receive it there. or not? So there's, so there's life after death. Then you believe somehow, I mean, we may not be able to explain that, but you believe there's life after death because Moses and Elijah were there prior to the resurrection. I believe right. that they were there. Of course, they were. They were written in yeah. God's book of life. What about they, what about the record Samuel, of the covenant? Um, when 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 the witch at Endor raised Samuel from from the grave, um, what's your what's was he in a spiritual body? Or what, what, I don't know, and I don't him? care to come in on that. It's kind of spooky to me, so I really don't know. I do okay. know that Samuel uh, is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of those who had died and not received the eternal inheritance. Fair enough. Let me ask you this question along these same lines. What is the difference between a disembodied spirit and a spiritual body? It depends on what you're meaning by a spiritual body. I don't really um, uh, subscribe Was, to the, I, I don't subscribe to the uh, platonic view of man. I don't believe that man has a soul. I believe he is a soul. The scripture says he was made a living suke, a living being. Do you think and, the goal is to go to heaven though, right? That's that's the goal? Well, the goal was for heaven to come to us. That's Revelation chapter uh, 21. Uh, uh, and I, uh, behold, the tabernacle of God is with me. And I saw the new Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the holy city descending out of heaven from God to be with men. That's how Christ comes to us. That's also what's going on in first Thessalonians chapter four. Uh, you might want to listen to N.T. Wright on that too. He's kind of doing a pretty good job of understanding first Thessalonians these days. 
was the uh, was the new creation launched when Jesus' physical body was raised from the dead? It was launched when he rose from the dead he, because here's the text in first Peter chapter three and the verse is 18. Um, he says, for Christ has suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust being put to death in the flesh, which is the old covenant realm of the flesh. That's not talking about his physical body. Those are locatives in the Greek. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Romans 1, 3, and 4 says Christ was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, but was declared to be the son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Colossians 1, 18 says he's the firstborn from the dead and the beginning of the new creation. So yes, he's the beginning of the new creation, but in the realm of the spirit. Okay. Um, all right. That's a little bit different than how you answered. Um, so that's, that's, that's fine. What, what um, did I say? Tell me what I said. If, if oh, you think I need some clarity. Oh, I'd have to, I'd have to look here there, William. Um, I believe you said that he, he was not the beginning of the new creation here. Not in the sense of um, a physical creation is what I, what I was uh, saying there. You're right. You're right. Because you don't believe that that Jesus raised body was any different than his than than what it went into the grave. Right. Right. It still had holes in it. It still had had the print right. wounds in it. It still had the uh, so, nail. Right. So, in so his it hand. was just a re it was a reconstitution of his old body. Right. Kind of like Lazarus. What you think? Yeah. He just raised up his body. Right. Right. And that's so his no change, body. Yeah, like, like, it, like is a, re a reconstitution like Lazarus's. Yeah. Okay. Um, is the Holy Spirit a new covenant promise today? The Holy Spirit was the, from from what text in the New Testament are you citing? Give me a New Testament text that says okay. that. The, and and what what uh, mode of the Holy Spirit are you talking about? Are you speaking of a miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit? And me, if so, let me, give me the text that you are referring to. Let me let me let me rephrase the question: Are believers indwelt with the Holy Spirit today? Yes, but not according miraculously in the in the sense that the spirit was poured out according to Joel's prophecy. Here's what the scripture says, and I've I've given you this several times because number one, uh, in First Corinthians one, it says that they would be confirmed unto the end, and he spoke that to the Corinthians. I don't think any of them who were living then are living now. So it was they who were going to be confirmed until the day of Christ. First Corinthians one six through eight. You can parallel that with Mark 16, 20 and Matthew 28 and verse 20. Now, what the Bible tells us in John 20, 30 and 31, that truly many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. So we have scripture that is sufficient to produce faith. And in producing that faith, he says that you may have life through his name. So we have the written word that contains the miracles that the Holy Spirit and God and Christ felt were sufficient enough to produce the faith that we need to have the life. So we don't need to go around either working miracles or pretending that we do, because what has been confirmed has been confirmed. The miracles were designed to bring them from the state of, of uh, infancy to the state of uh, adulthood, as Ephesians 4 uh, 11 through 13 says to the unity of the faith until they became a full grown man, which they were children and a child under age, under legal age cannot inherit. That's Galatians chapter four and verse one. All right. So let me, let me, uh, let me focus on some time statements um, in particular until um, we see this a lot until, until, until. So Ephesians 1, 14 and 4, 30. It says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of the purchased redemption. Our, 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 if you believe that the, the day of the purchased redemption was in 70 AD, are, is anybody sealed today then? Not miraculously. That's Again, the sealing okay, of the so Spirit no, no was a is, miraculous sealing. No, no one is. So no one is, is sealed. Um, Actually, uh, Scott. Time has flown by. Yep. You get uh, time for one more question. We'll give William the final word, then we'll we'll change it up. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work and he will perform it until 
the day of Jesus Christ, you believe that has already happened, does that mean that God is not doing a good work in you today because it's already been fulfilled? No, it means that he's not doing the work of bringing them out of the Exodus like he was in the first century, just like in the historical Exodus. That first generation went through the Exodus one time, but once they had gone through it, they entered into the land. So all of the people who were born in the land didn't have to go and backtrack and come back 40 years to get into the land. They were simply born into it. All right, gentlemen, that you, is William. our first 25 minutes. Time flew by. I'm also doing my best to save all of these questions from our very much engaged live chat. So Scott, William, good job on the first 25 minutes, keeping it uh, organic and engaging at the same time. So we've got the next 25 minute cross exam. William, you get to lead the way this time. And so let me restart the timer. And gentlemen, go ahead. All right. My first question is taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, along with Luke chapter 13, uh, uh, I'd say around verse 26 and following. But it's regarding um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets rising up to sit down in the kingdom of God. Uh, question number one, has that occurred? And if so, show us from the text that either it has or that it hasn't. And what are you using to say that it hasn't? Yeah, no, I, I believe that it that it has. I believe the evidence was starting to be revealed at the day of Pentecost. We're, we're born again into the kingdom of God and we're born by the spirit. So Colossians 1.13 tells us that we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. All of that happened prior to 70 AD. And so I believe um, really Pentecost onward, it was very evident who was in the kingdom and who not. The same, uh, you know, I would cite the, the same uh, miraculous things that the believers were doing at that time, demonstrating the kingdom. And of course, the end of Mark, um, you know, as far as what was the purpose of all of these miraculous things, it was to confirm their word with signs following, which was happening, demonstrating that the kingdom of God had come and they were in it. And those who didn't trust Christ were out. All right. Would you read the text and tell us? what it says in the text, you said it started on the day of Pentecost. So were the right. Jews cast out of the kingdom on the day of Pentecost? Yes, they were. Uh, uh, Romans chapter, Romans chapter 11, Paul talks about those who were cut off in Acts chapter three. Peter also talks about, you know, he, he cites Moses saying, you know, those who don't hear that prophet shall be destroyed or cut off from among the people. And okay, that when, was were happening, they, when were they destroyed that, from that among was, the people? That that was happening. That was starting during that day. Um, so so those who rejected Christ, they were cut off from, from their own covenant people. So, so yes, uh, it, it happened well before 70 AD. Okay, so if it started happening before 70 AD, when did it consummate? Or is it still it ongoing? Okay. All right. So you I, said I, 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 you don't think it you don't yeah, think it yeah. has. All right. So so according to the text in Luke chapter 13, he identifies the people to whom he was speaking. Would you go there and read the text and tell us who he's talking to and how do you know who they are? Luke 13, what? Luke 13, let's say around verse 20, uh, start at verse 26 and go through verse 29. Then shall he begin to say that we have eaten drunken in thy presence. Right? I mean, he's, he's talking to that contemporary generation, right? That's certainly true. Um, and I, I mean, there is a sense ultimately, you know, in, in which Christ did bring judgment in 70 AD. But again, I, I, uh, as far as when did this when did this occur? Well, when did the kingdom of God appear? The kingdom of God appeared when Jesus showed up, right? The kingdom of God uh, arrived with Jesus, and people started to be born into the kingdom after Pentecost. So, so you have that delineation with people being in the kingdom and those who are not. Um, and certainly that was relevant to that contemporary generation. And we could say that certainly if we want to say there was a, a manifestation of that in 70 AD. Sure, you could say that. Okay, so you would agree then that this text has a fulfillment in 70 AD. 
I think now. Okay, just I, I'm, I'm not saying you can answer. The ultimate, I'm going to yeah, ask I, you. I think, I think there's certainly a fulfillment. Okay, all right. In Hebrews chapter 11, since we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob entering the kingdom, uh, Hebrews chapter mm -hmm. 11, starting in verse 13, uh, the text says, and this is well after Pentecost, it's around what, 64 AD? Um, the text mm -hmm. says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's been discussed so far. Yep. And he says, but mm -hmm. having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the land. For those who say such things declare plain that they seek a homeland. Uh, in verse 16, mm -hmm. he says, but now they desire a better or a heavenly country. Is the heavenly country the kingdom or no? Um. I, I I think you it could be the kingdom depending on how this would how one would define that but I think ultimately their their hope was a renewed earth which is why in Romans chapter 4 you know Abraham and his seed should be heir to the world ultimately they were looking for the kingdom to come on this earth earth for for a renewed creation so to speak so I don't think they were just Can thinking you about further define that I, what do you mean I, by I don't renewed believe that creation they had the, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, after after the fall, um, the earth was cursed, and and you have you you have essentially the rest of the biblical story talking about how God was going to redeem mankind and restore creation. In the very beginning, I think you see in the garden you have a you have heaven and earth overlap and and interlock. I, I think you have um, you know a, a conjunction of heaven and earth, and ultimately, I think that's where the story ends up. So on, on your real physical earth. And that was that was the, the Jewish hope. The Jewish hope wasn't the platonic Greek idea of going to a spiritual heaven somewhere. It was always about being here on this earth. Okay, next question. In Hebrews chapter 12, I think that's a chapter you like, uh, and verse 25 um, through uh, 28, he talks about, do not refuse the one who speaks, uh, for if they did not escape him who refused him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape from him if we turn away from him who speaks in heaven. And he says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying yet once more. Do you take the word now there to refer to the present time, or do you take it to refer to a time in our future? I think he says yet, yet once more. And, and here he's quoting from... It's like Haggai or, or something like oh, that. Haggai, yeah, Haggai yeah. two sixty eight. <laughs> right, right. So, um, I, I, this is a this is a warning for those Hebrews that were being persecuted in the sixties, that were falling away from the faith, and 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 here he's using Hebrew motifs in order to demonstrate that falling away from the faith has severe consequences, so including would... a judgment that will come. Okay, so you would take that as the heaven and earth being destroyed in that day and time, because he says it was already I, I, I being not, shaken. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, when we talk about heaven and earth being destroyed, I think ultimately the 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 Hebrew hope wasn't for a completely, um, you know, for for this earth to be completely annihilated. Um, well, now some some take minute, that view, but, but it's a it's about redemption. It's about restoration, restoring God. God made a good world, not not a well, bad let, world. Let's, let's read so the it's text. about restoring God's Hold good on a world. Second. He says, "Now this yet once more, verse twenty seven indicates the removal mm -hmm. of those things which are being sure. shaken, as of things that are mm -hmm. made." And that's an elliptical phrase I take to mean made with hands. That the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now, what he says could not be shaken was the kingdom, but he says that right. could be shaken and removed. So do you believe yep. that it's going to remain when he says it's not? I I, I think this, this mirrors or matches, let's say, what you find in Matthew chapter 13 with the wheat and the tares. When, when when the kingdom is consummated, what happens? The wicked are removed from the earth. And this is what it's referring to. It's it's judgment. It's using judgment language in which the, the wicked are removed from the earth. Not not the, the righteous are removed from the earth, but the wicked are removed from the earth. And so I believe that's this is what this is getting at. The whole the whole 
narrative of the Bible is going back towards restoration and redemption in which, again, God created a good world. Uh, he's not going to throw it all away, but it will be transformed just like we're transformed. Okay. Um, in uh, Let's see. Let's go to, um, let's get some resur re resurrection passages here. In, um, do you believe that Matthew 13 is a quote from Daniel 12? Is referencing Daniel 12? Where, what in Matthew 13? Uh, Matthew 13, the text you just cited, Matthew 13, the harvest. And secondly, what the, do you, the, 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 the harvest that occurred in Matthew chapter 3 with John the Baptist, when did that occur? The, the in, one that he spoke in, in about. Chapter Matthew chapter 3, uh, starting around uh -huh. verse, what, uh, 10 through 12? Uh-huh. I, oh, I think there in Matthew chapter 3, what is he talking? He's using Old Testament. It's an Old Testament judgment motif. Um, you know, he's got his fan in his hand. He is, he is I think, in particular, that's an allusion to what's going to uh, come in 70 AD. Uh, certainly, I think that that's the case. But I don't find... I don't find uh, what John says in Matthew chapter 3 to be equivalent with what we find, say, in Matthew chapter 13. I believe the content is very, very different. All right. Uh, in, well, I don't want to ask you any more questions about the age just yet or, um, or that text. Let me ask you uh, this question. In 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 15, when the text uses the present active indicative and the present passive to say it is being sown in corruption. It is being raised. Now, since you take that to be the physical body, can you show us an example of a physical body being raised? And this, of course, is not Jesus's resurrection because that's a done deal. So where are they being raised and what example do you have from scripture? Right. So I think Physically. what you're saying is, is you're, you're saying that 1 Corinthians 15, I hear you say that this passage is referring to something that's ongoing, right, um, that, that, that's present. And so you want, you want physical evidence that that's happening or that has happened from this time onward. I would say just looking at the text, um, if we could park on, on one or two words or whatever and look at their tense, but you have to look at the overall context and how this flows. Well, I have copies Back of the tense if you want to see them. Verse verse 35, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? And this, this is just tied back to what we find in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, in which people were denying the resurrection of Christ, which is why he spends so much time talking about the bodily resurrection of Christ. And the whole point here is that it goes into the ground and it comes out transformed, just like Jesus's body was. It went into okay. the ground it, and it, it was transformed. That's that's All the right. illusion. Here. Let me ask you a question on that. Um, the text says, and you can see also John 12, 24, Jesus said, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, do you put a dead seed in the ground in order to grow a crop? A, a dead seed? Yes. I, I don't think that's, the, I don't think that's a the, seed, the example a seed, that Jesus no, is giving. Well, I, that's not the question I ask you. The seed, the seed goes I just into the ask you, can you do that? Do you, is that what people do? They put a seed that has no life in it in the ground. No, 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 that's not. Yeah, okay. people don't do that. So here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, that which you sow is not made alive unless it is dying. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. he's using the present tense there again. So whatever he's calling the body, he says it is dying. And he's, I, and he's, I'm not and he's sure speaking, what you think that's, he's speaking of that the dead. To? Well, that my, I'm asking the questions here. So he said, 
what you sow is not made alive except un mm -hmm. or unless it is dying. So, so just to, so you think that this is something that's ongoing. And if this is referring to the dead ones, then it stands to reason that you believe between 30 AD and 70 AD, the dead ones were presently dying and rising, that, that, that was, that was happening, that, that was, uh, that was the process, right? I'm Sorry. asking that, you That's the how question. I take it. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, how, that's how I would, that's how I would take it. Well, let's, that let's look at it this to, way. Let's look at exactly what the way. text is saying. It says, it is being sown. It mm -hmm. is being raised. Mm -hmm. One is a uh, present passive. The other one is a present middle. Right. So, so in light of that, though, so you, you think so you, you no, think so that, you tell us what the answer is. You think it's being. I, if, that's what I'm saying. If you think if if it's being sown, right. I don't want to know, know what I think. I want to know what you think the text is saying. I'm I'm telling you. I'm telling okay. you. I'm uh, just let me let me answer here. If that's the case, if you if if you think that being sown is something that's present and ongoing, and that refers to the dead ones prior to Christ, I don't know how that's an ongoing thing in Paul's day and age. In other words, that's not happening after 30 AD. It can't. Well, because Scott. people after the resurrection are are you can't be being sown because that's not that's not a possibility anymore for the dead ones. The dead ones refers to those prior to Christ, but after Christ comes, like Paul, and people. Well, let me ask you. The, the Bible says dying, the, the question says you can't have that. The question says how? How well you may not can have it. The question says how are the dead ones raised up, and with what body do they come? And then Paul's answer is, oh, foolish one, what you are sowing is not made alive unless it is dying. So right. I'm asking you, so, who is it that's being, so wait, wait, would, wait, 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 who is being sown in that text? Is it the living or the dead? It's, it's, it's believers in Christ. Wait a that, minute. No, 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 <laughs> no. No, I'm giving you the answer. Whether you okay, like it or not, you don't have to All like right. the answer. I'm saying okay, it's ahead. believers you're, you're right in about Christ that. because. Right. It's, it's believers in Christ, because are there people who are dying in Paul's day presently being sown? Yep, there sure is. There sure is. And how will they be raised? Right. Well, their body goes into the grave presently, actively. Right. And later on, it's going to be raised up from the grave. Now, that's it's not raised. It's not, you know, raised up as soon as it gets to the grave. He, he clearly says that they're, the raising up is something that's yet future. Because he talks about that in verses 51 and following, right? But presently, there are people where, who are dying in Paul's contemporary generation, and their bodies are being sown. Okay, where does he what? say it's yet future? How? Here's a question. How can he tell you in, in verse 42 through 43 that it is being sown, present, it, passive, excuse me, it and it is being raised, all right, and then tell you that it has not happened at all and is totally future in verses 50 through uh 54. The 51 and 52 tell us behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep in other words we won't all physically die right who is the, the we? who is the we in the context it's his audience okay it's, it's so paul, paul is speaking as one as one to his audience and so where are they where, where are these corinthians to right. whom he wrote that that he said we shall not all sleep He's telling those believers that are alive during that time. He said, "Hey, we won't all sleep. We won't all physically die." But so, so hold on a second. Can't. Did some of them possibly get raised from the physical death, according to your paradigm? Since you said in Matthew eight eleven that um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were raised, and of course we read in Hebrews eleven They're that raised they, spiritually, they, they weren't just like Paul. No, 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 <laughs> no, They're no, raised no. spiritually, just like Paul. So the first resurrection, in, they take part. So Abraham, in the first Isaac, and Jacob were raised cross, physically. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were raised physically, according to Matthew 8, 11, and 12, on the day of Pentecost. Oh, I, I, I believe so, yeah. Wow. Well, if not prior to that. If not prior to that. Well, Ephesians 4 tells us that he led captivity captive, right? So Where, where was captivity? So well, who it, it was, was it that it was, was still else. hoping? Who, or, okay, now watch. We just left Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, therefore, we are receiving paralambonantes, present participle we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved all right we left hebrews 11 
verse 13 through 16, verse 16 particularly, that says they were now looking for the heavenly city. Do you believe when a person enters the heavenly city that that is when he's raised from physical death? When he enters into, no, I think you're conflating two different things. Um, no, you just said that Abraham had already raised from the dead on the day of Pentecost physically. No, I didn't say that he raised from the dead physically. He was he was raised spiritually in Christ. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob spiritually were raised in Christ. Okay, I didn't say what physically. are they? So what Physi is what physical is the, resurrection is a separate thing in the future. So is the heavenly city, and a that's what I believe city? Paul is referring to. Is the heavenly city a physical or a spiritual city? And how does that compare well, with the Jerusalem that now is in Galatians four twenty five? It's 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 both. Um, uh, you and I are physical, right? And yet we've come to Zion. No, no, no. In that's terms what, of our soteriology and eschatology, just, we're I'm not just, physical. We are spiritual. Paul said, "The man who is in the flesh cannot please God." He says, "But you're in the so spirit." You're not so not spiritual. Uh, well, oh, I, I have a physical you body right, but, from that but I'm, point of view. I'm, but what I'm, I'm saying I'm, is, I'm, I'm, Paul is arguing covenantal states in Romans chapter eight. He's not arguing the physical flesh versus non-corporeal right. flesh. I would disagree with. I would disagree with you on that. But as far as the kingdom is concerned, concerned, it is spiritual and it is physical. It is both. It's not an either or, William. It's a both. Wait a minute. Well, here's here's what the Bible says. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. So what part of that right, is physical? Right. Right. But the kingdom of God arrived with Jesus and he was physical. Was he not? Yes, he was. See, in 2 right. Corinthians if, 5 and verse... 2 Corinthians 5, I think it's verse 16. He says, yeah. though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know mm -hmm. we him after the flesh no more. Yeah. I just quoted Romans yep. chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that says he was born of the flesh of the seed of David, but he was re declared mm -hmm. to be the son of God according to the spirit, spirit of holiness. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Romans 7, 5 says uh, that they died to the flesh that they were held by and they rose in the spirit. Yep. So why are you talking about people still in the flesh? It's because you got to have a physical body. That's what they're, it is. They're uh, they're 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 next both. Question. When Jesus when when all right, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. In um first Corinthians, let me go back to my chart. Now you said what's the difference then and how can Paul affirm in first Corinthians chapter 15? How much time do I have left, Dunny? You have three and a half minutes. All right. I'll try to get this in. All right. Um, in 1 Corinthians, when the chapter starts, Paul says that those brethren believed in the gospel. They were standing in the gospel. They had received the gospel. Now, if they had done that, did they believe in their own resurrection? Uh, who, who are you talking about here? I'm saying, did they, reverse. I'm talking about the believers. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which also I preach to you, which also mm -hmm. you have re received and wherein you stand, yeah, wherein you stand. by which yep. also and you where, where are is... saved. If you yeah, keep they, in yeah, memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. So did all of those yep. people that he talks about, and even in verse 12, I think he says, where, whether it were I or they, so we preach, so you have believed. So did all of them believe in their own resurrection from the dead? Not all of them are believers. So Wait Paul, a isn't, Paul is getting at that. Paul, Paul, has Paul said just it, said it, says, you believed and you stand in the but, gospel. So how were right, they not all he, believers? He, he is he is questioning those who have believed in vain. But no, that's, no, that's no, no, no. That's not what he's doing. That's a consequence of the... Uh, denial of the resurrection. Unless, unless, not, but listen to my question, Scott. Not, a, not everybody's a believer. Scott, not everybody's listen to my a question. Believer, I didn't ask you about everybody. I'm not asking. I'm asking about the church at Corinth right. that he wrote to. Right. That he said all of them yep. believed. Did he not say that? They, they, yeah, they may have professed belief. Uh, right? uh, Every, everybody, you, everybody now in you the tell church. me I can't tell who a Christian is, but you can read their minds. Everybody, hold on a sec. Everybody who claims to be a Christian isn't a Christian. William doesn't work that way, right? Just because Look, someone claims... Paul, what did Paul say about them in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? He wrote to the saints who were at Corinth. Did he not? Right, right. Okay. He sure did. They but, were there is, but there are unbelievers amongst believers. I didn't like say Matthew that there weren't, but when he wrote to the Corinthians... A little bit of cross Okay. 
So he he's he's writing to the Corinthian to the Corinthian church. Yes, I agree, right? But he is he is essentially delineating and saying, unless you believe in vain. In other words, he is talking not only to those who are true believers in that church, but he's also trying to rouse up those who profess something that they're really not. No. He, okay. He did say, unless you have believed in vain, but he affirmed that they mm -hmm. had believed and that they were saved. Now, when he goes into in the believing in vain, it's because he says some among you deny the resurrection of the dead ones. Right. My question to you was, how could they deny the resurrection of any dead if they believed that they were going to be raised? How could that how could they say they didn't believe in resurrection is my question. But the they believe they're going physical, to be raised. Spiritual. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Spiritually, they're raised. Right. That and that and that's just it. It's the context is a denial of physical resurrection, which is why Paul spends so much time no, talking no. about <laughs> Jesus's physical resurrection. OK. All right. I got it, you. It's it's physical. All right. William, if you'd like to you get one last question. All right. Here's my last question. In First Corinthians 15, there's an inclusio where Paul cites Hosea chapter six to talk about the death uh, when he says Christ was raised again the third day. And he cites Hosea chapter six, one and two, and the context of chapter five. And you can look in that context and see what that problem was. And then he quotes Hosea at the end of the chapter, chapter 13 and verse 14, uh, to say that I will ransom them from the power of the grave. So in those contexts and in those chapters in Hosea is the context about sin, death, and being restored to God, to a right relationship with him as a result of their idolatry, et cetera, or is it about bringing a body uh, out bringing bodies out of the grave with uh, with Christ, physical bodies. Well, similar to that, that I wrote back to you, I believe your presupposition is wrong. When it says in verse three and four um, that Christ died and he rose again, according to the scriptures, I don't think Paul is proof texting here. I think what Paul is talking about is it's according to the story, the, the meta narrative of, of, of Israel's story. According to that story, Jesus died. He suffered. He, he rose again. According to that story, it's the next or the, the penultimate or the ultimate thing that would come back in at the end of a chapter. You mentioned, um, you know, the, the quotation from Hosea, which is also found in Isaiah as well. But but Paul clearly says in verse 54, when this happens, then shall be brought to pass the same. So clearly that wasn't the case yet for Paul, even though he was raised with Christ already partaking in salvation. He was saved, yet death had not been swallowed up in victory because he includes himself among those people. When this corruptible puts on incorruption, then, then shall it be brought to pass the saying death is swallowed up in victory. It hadn't happened when Paul, as, as of the time that Paul wrote this letter, even though he was saved. But he did say that it was going to happen before some of them died, before all of them died. No, I don't. Anyway, I, I think don't, that's I, my I, time. Is it not? Uh, Scott? Yep. Okay. I mean, uh, Dunn, excuse me. That's right. <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> trying to say you look alike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, uh, great, <laughs> fast paced cross exam in many ways. It didn't feel like 50 minutes. And so good job to the both of you keeping us all, that includes the audience and myself, engaged. I like to not be too intrusive on these cross exams. And so I think you both did a good job, good professional job, keeping each other on point and making sure you guys were answering the uh, questions properly. So what I'm going to do is restart the timer as we do still have closing statements. And so if there's anything you both feel has been left hanging, but you would like to respond to, we do have, again, five minutes to conclude our thoughts. And so, Scott, since you started us off in this debate, let's give you the first five minutes and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, Donnie, let's go ahead and um, if you can share that again, what comes up. <clears throat> Perfect. What I've tried to lay out uh, is we're talking about the resurrection, right? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23, gives us an order of resurrection. Christ, and, and, and as we're speaking of resurrection, it's important to delineate, right? There, there is something that ha happens to us spiritually, but there's also something that happens to us physically. We, you know, Christ came to save wholes, not just souls, all right? Um, it's why his ministry was 
was filled with miraculous things that was happening, restoration, what, to people's body. The kingdom of the age to come was breaking into this present world, and it was being manifest as people were being made whole. Not just their souls, but their actual bodies. And so it's important to, to realize that from, from 30 AD onward, when Christ won the victory, and, and let's be clear, death, I mean, there was, there was real victory over death by Christ. And yet Paul still says that something else must happen in the future and then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. How do we make sense of that? There's only one way you can make sense of it. First, you have Christ who won the victory. It's 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 it is the already but not yet. Um, and, and and certainly it's true with Christ. He died, uh, was was buried, rose again from the grave, showing how he defeated Satan, sin, and death. And therein lies our victory. And so in Christ, we are victorious. In this first resurrection, we are bound up in him. We talk about the corporate body. I mean, this is why the body of Christ, you know, uh, uh, you know, Jesus as king, as Messiah, the, 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 uh, you know, he represents Israel corporately. And Gentiles have been grafted into that, right? So, so we are corporately together called the body of Christ. All of that is incorporated in the first resurrection. All that happens to every single believer and has from 30 AD onward. So when, when Paul speaks about a resurrection to come, right, who is he talking about? Well, William, William says, well, he, it, it, you know, it can't be Paul because Paul's raised, right? So he's out. You can't, you can't have Paul or any of the contemporary believers from 30 AD onward because they're raised spiritually. They've received spiritual life, eternal life. They're partakers in this. In, in, in the in the corporate body of Christ. What William and some of these full preterists do is say, well, it, it, since it can't refer to Paul and his contemporary generation, it has to refer to pre-Jesus saints who died because they haven't been raised yet. Um, and, and so everything, what they do is they, 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 they match that concept onto the language which talks about something future to come. William and I would both agree as far as the Bible talks about this second resurrection. There is something, whether you agree, you know, uh, as, as an audience member, whether you think that happened in 70 AD or it's in the future, Paul is writing from the standpoint, say in 56 AD, that there is something that is yet to come, right? The second resurrection, this stage, the, the, the idea is what is that? What is that? And, and does that have anything to do with us? And Paul seems to indicate, yeah, it does have something to do with us because it has something to do with him. Because even though he was standing in victory in Christ, right, he's still waiting for the day when something will happen in which death will be swallowed up in victory. And what else could that be but physical death? Death continues on even today, right? Um, Jesus tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, or Paul does, that the last enemy is death, right? So there is in a sense that death has been defeated by Christ, but it's, it is an ongoing foe. It is an enemy. And Christ is at the right hand of the Father until he makes all enemies under his footstool, the last enemy being death. 40 seconds. What preterism does is it takes everything... It, it, it disregards the fact that we as, as human beings are not just spiritual, but we're spiritual and physical. And therefore, salvation, the great salvation that we have in Christ, is, is not either spiritual or it's physical. It's, it's both and. It encompasses both dynamics in which we are spiritually raised with Christ and redeemed, but our body will be too. It will match the reality that is that is present now for those of us in Christ. Um, and with that, th thanks. Yo, I'll, I'll shut her down there. Appreciate it. Okay, Scott. Appreciate the five-minute concluding statement. William, we're going to hand it back to you. You now um, have your five-minute concluding statement. Go ahead. One quick second, please. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Okay. Well, um, it's been an interesting discussion. Uh, I would love to have five nights to deal with this subject.
so that we could really thresh it out. But we have um, presented to you, and let me get this on the uh, screen again. I keep forgetting to do it. All right, as I pointed out from the beginning, we talked about the resurrection of the dead ones. The reason Scott's having problems with uh, who the dead ones were and um, the fact that Paul said that all of those to whom he wrote believed, none of them denied their own resurrection. They were denying the resurrection, some, not all of them, some of them were denying the resurrection of the dead ones. And that's why Paul had these consequences because Jesus rose out from among the dead ones uh, as you see here, uh, the consequences that Paul gave them since they believed that Jesus had risen and they believed that they were being raised, then he's saying, if you believe Christ, who was one of these dead ones, rose from the dead, then you can't deny the resurrection of the dead ones. That's why he has these consequences. And he argues it this way. He says, if the dead ones do not rise, then is Christ not risen. Why? Because Christ was one of them. He has solidarity with them. And so that's the point that he makes. And then once he establishes that point, then he moves on to some consequences of those who were denying the resurrection. He says, if Christ is not risen, because once he de destroys that uh, argument, he says, if Christ is not risen uh, and who ra was raised as the first fruits, he says, then your faith is vain. So he's now telling them, I've told you that you were saved, but if you want to argue that the dead ones are not going to rise or are not being raised, then your faith is vain. And what's the consequence? He doesn't say the consequence is you won't be raised from the dead. He's, I mean, from physical death. He says the consequence is you uh they were yet in their sins so that's the consequence of resurrection not occurring it's being in sin and then that would make the apostles false witnesses because they testified of god that he raised up christ and that he rose to put away sin and they're saying that it didn't occur um and then the consequence of the believer who dies was that they would perish because they would have no resurrection um or their resurrection would have been in vain, or they wouldn't have had one, actually. And therefore, he's saying that they would have perished in death, but they wouldn't perish in death. They accepted none of these consequences. They did not perish or believe they had. They did not believe the apostles were false witnesses, because if they did, that meant their salvation was invalid, and they did not believe that faith was vain, etc. And um, Christ was the first fruit that meant that the harvest had already begun, and that he's the first fruit of the resurrection which uh, Scott is trying to claim is a physical resurrection, but that means imminent. The first fruit is a term that means it was already occurring or about to be completed, as I showed in the passage that we mentioned. And then when we go back uh, to this text, I've given you the covenantal uh, change and what happened during that transition between the cross and 40 years, which was uh, what they refer to as the last days. Scott thinks that apparently believes that he's still in the last days, but that's not the case. The last days were the last days of the old covenant age that overlapped for a while until that old covenant age passed away. That was the body or the ministration of death. That was the uh, ministry of, of condemnation. Now, he um, uh, tried to say that it was a presupposition to go to Hosea 6. Uh, I didn't have time to ask him, but I'd like to know, since he wants to talk about the, me the meta narrative, where are all the uh, passages in the Old Testament that talk about Christ rising from the dead on the third day? He won't find any but the one that we see um, uh, that we see there, or, or perhaps maybe two, but that's it. So Paul didn't have a broad selection to choose from for the third day. And how many times did he say during the ministry, the Son of Man had to go to Jerusalem, be killed and crucified and rise on the third day? The scriptures are not about the uh, deliverance from the death of Abel, which was physical death. They are about deliverance from the death of Adam, which was sin death the day that he died. The Holy Spirit was poured out to accomplish that in the last days of the age of Moses, in the last days of that old covenant age. He says death um, and Satan and all were to be put away. Well, Paul said in Romans 16, 20, that 30 seconds. God would crush Satan under your feet shortly, and that he uses the word intake, and that word means that not only would it be in a short time, but he would do it very quickly. Um, his arguments on Matthew 8, 11 really just uh, befuddled me. Um, 
he said that was a judgment in 70 AD. So there's your resurrection. They were raised up to sit in the kingdom of God. They had not done so by Hebrews 11. And we're still looking for it at that time. So I will leave it at that. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, William. Okay, gentlemen, that wraps up the concluding statements. And great job. I had a lot of fun. This was a very comprehensive debate. Uh, we've had an excellent audience the whole time and it's been a lively chat. So we've had a solid mix of views in, in the live chat, which means we've got a lot of great questions for the both of you, Scott and William. You've really given us a debate to remember. There's a lot of hype for this. So you guys did not uh, disappoint. Uh, real quick, 30 second break before we get into audience questions. For those that love these eschatology debates, we have a February full of eschatology debates. So we'll be kicking off next month with uh, Dr. Robertson Jenis and Phelan McFallon, the great millennium debate, premillennialism -millenni pre versus amillennialism. We've also got a debate that I'm pumped for on Israel. What is God's plan for Israel? Two experienced debaters for this one. David Preston, Steve Gregg. This will be next month as well. And we've also got two other debates mm -hmm. that I got to get thumbnails for. A Pastor Anthony Aquino and Professing Preterist on Is Full Preterism Biblical? And Pastor Tommy McMurtry versus Phelan McFallon on Matthew 24. So lots to look forward to in February. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to get into these audience questions now. Scott and William. Let me restart the timer. We've got 30 minutes to engage questions and we have a lot of questions. And so I don't like to rush my guests in answering, but maybe just so we can get through as many as we can, why don't we try and limit each response to two minutes each? So what we'll do is this, William, let's say the question's for you. You get roughly two minutes to just try and be cognizant though. I don't want to interrupt you guys as you're in mid thought. Just try maybe two minutes each, two minutes for William, two minutes to Scott. And then we would throw it back to William for a final word of one minute. Okay. And that way we'll get through as many questions as we can, I think. So let's start right at the beginning and go with our super chats here that have come in. Okay, here we go. Anthony Aquino, appreciate it. $5 super chat. Questions for you, William. So he asks, the heart of Jesus stopped beating on the cross. Did the heart of Jesus stop beating a second time after the resurrection? He quotes Romans 6, verse 9. Did the heart of Jesus stop beating a second time? Uh, I'm really not understanding what he's trying to get at there. Um, the scripture says that Christ died to sin in Romans, uh, I think that's Romans 6, 9, or let me make sure that I'm quoting the text. That's Romans 6, 10 that says he died to sin. Um, but he might want to clarify that a little bit so I can understand what he's trying to say. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. The text says in uh, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all and the life that he lives he lives to god so jesus didn't die um in for, to sin but once and that's the only death that he died to sin in terms of what i understand the scripture to be saying so i don't see where you're saying that he died to sin again if that's what you mean i'm not really not sure so you, maybe um, you'll give us some more clarification on that but go ahead Thank you, William. Anthony, if you are in the chat and wanted to, so I do want to honor your super chat. If you wanted to send anything in, in terms of clarification, feel free to do so. Scott, over to you. I Yeah, I think I can provide some clarity there. I mean, okay. Romans 6 and 9 says, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. So, so he died and he died in the flesh, but once. Right, what what Anthony is getting at? Well, does Jesus have a physical body today? We didn't really talk about that here in this debate. Um, I believe that Jesus, yes, physically ascended to the Father in heaven. His body 
fills both heaven and earth. Ephesians tells us that. Um, there's, there's both a physical and a spiritual aspect to that. But is it the case? So, so if a person believes that, that Jesus doesn't have a physical body now, like, well, what happened to it? Where did it go? Um, there are some who believe that, you know, was Jesus was going up into the atmosphere, his body burned up. So that would mean his physical body died a second time. His heart beat it, stopped beating a second time, which would be in violation of Romans 6, 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Hebrews chapter 7 talks about that as well. We have, we have a priest who ever lives to make intercession for us because he dies no more. Um, Jesus died physically, he rose physically, and he exists today physically and spiritually. Again, salvation isn't either spiritual or physical. It's not an either or proposition. It's a both and. We as physical beings, are, are there is a spiritual and physical dynamic to this. Um, and to ignore that and just say the physical doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the physical. It's all the spiritual, right? That that is a distortion of the scriptures. It's a distortion. It is a it's it's a Gnostic heresy, is what it is. That's that's what Gnosticism is all about. That what's what Plato uh, Platonism is all about. Spiritualizing everything and just making heaven the goal. It's it's we're just going to go to a spiritual heaven. This body's bad and drab, and we're, we're better. It's a prison, and we just need to escape escape it. Um, and, and so. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah, G Jesus didn't die a second time. He, he still has his body today. Thank you, Scott. William, you get the last word because the question was for you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the scriptures say the secret things belong to God. I don't have any revelations from scripture in terms of what happened to Jesus's body. I do know that the death that he died was a death to sin, and he only died once as far as death to sin. If we take that out of the covenantal setting in which it is and try to make something in a purely physical mode, we're stepping outside of the scriptures to come up with a quibble uh, in terms of trying to find some evidence to prove physical resurrection. Even if it were the case, it still wouldn't prove that the resurrection is physical based on the information that we have presented in this discussion because those were dealing with transitioning out of a covenantal mode. Now, is was the people who were the people who were alive involved in that? Yes, Paul was a living person who died with Christ to sin and rose in righteousness. He was still in his physical body. But I don't think that he's in his physical body today because there was not another resurrection like Scott has been trying to argue because he's making two hopes. We don't have two hopes. There's only one hope. There was only one resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. If Scott is in that resurrection, how did he get in there? He was baptized into it. He didn't physically die to get into Jesus. Now, he's the one arguing that you got to have more resurrection in Christ. It just doesn't work. Anyway, that's my response. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the responses. William, thank you for the final word. Okay, now we got one for Scott, and it's from Michael Sullivan. He's coming at you, Scott. He's bringing the heat. My man. So he says, Scott on Romans 8 claims to be a partial preterist, but apparently doesn't honor the three time texts in Romans 8. And he is asking you about other partial preterists, such as Lightfoot and Philip Kaiser, if I said that right. Scott, any thoughts? I don't know who Lightfoot or Philip Kaiser is. I'm not, I'm not sure. Claims to be a partial preterist, but doesn't honor the three time texts, Romans 8, 18 through 23. Well, I'll just read it here. Uh, 8, 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, meaning creation, not Israel, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, that's creation, was made subject to vanity. Where do we see that? Well, we see that back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, right? When the earth was cursed um, by reason of him who had put subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until today. 
and not only they, but uh, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And if there's any idea what redemption of our body is, we could go back to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, like Paul, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. Salva salvation isn't just a spiritual thing. It involves the whole person. And it involves creation too. Creation was made subject to vanity. It was cursed on account of man. Man was made of the earth, for the earth, to, to image God's wise stewardship in the earth. But instead of doing that, he imaged rebellion, bringing a curse. So how is God going to restore this mess? Well, he has to restore mankind, and he does that. He, he does that. He put his plan into place through Israel and Christ being the tip of the spear. And by making mankind right, he puts the whole world right. This is why the, the uh, 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 hope in the future, not only is that the redemption of our body, but the redemption of creation as well, the, the curse reversed restoration redemption to all of creation and so um yeah we didn't get to that text but that's that's a that's a great one that that illustrates um that this in fact is is talking about uh, something future in particular the redemption of creation now i'll just say this and i'll shut up and i'll let william respond because i think we're going to hear is they're going to say that the creature um they're going to the, the word can be defined a couple different ways and they're going to say that's israel that Israel was made subject to vanity and somehow Israel is groaning and all that kind of stuff. But if you really think about that and think that through, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, it is it is the creation and it goes back all the way to Genesis chapter three. Thank you, Scott. William, floor is yours. All right. Um, Romans chapter eight. I know that there is one. Um, uh, imminent statement in verse 18. Uh, it, it doesn't read the way that Scott read it. It says that, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is about to be revealed in us. You can find that language in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. You can find it in resurrection passages. I quoted it in 2 Timothy. See, that's the problem with these guys. They want to call us uh, focusing on the spiritual, but they spiritualize every time statement that you can find in the scripture, pretty much. I'm not saying that's an absolute, but every time it comes down to one of these resurrection texts that doesn't fit their future body paradigm, they ignore it and act as though it's not in the text. Paul said this was about to take place. And by present time, he uses the word kairos, and it is an appointed present time. So that's the appointed time that Daniel spoke about in Daniel chapter 12 and uh, that we find in other passages. Jesus referred to it when he said that the appointed time is fulfilled, that the kingdom of God has drawn near, repent and believe the gospel. All of these passages were about the appointed time, which was near about to take place. Another one is found in Romans 8, uh, let's see, verse 13. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you are about to die. Same uh, emphasis on Melo in that uh, text as well. So that's an imminent text. He says they were about to die. Well, <laughs> if they were about to die physically, then that's not quite a, a very uh, happy and glorious gospel message if that took place. But I have something else to say on that too as uh, as we go. Another imminent statement, of course, is the first fruits. But I'm trying to say, I think there's another about to come uh, somewhere in this text. Uh, yeah, verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, see physical death doesn't separate you from God any more than physical life does. We would be trying to get out of physical, we ought to have the same feeling about life as wicked as we do about trying to get out of uh, a physical body, but they don't. He says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things about to come. So the things that the old covenant were shadows and types, just as in Hebrews 10, 
one uh, says those things were about to come. That's Colossians 2 as well, about the feast days and the Sabbaths, etc. Those things were about to come. They were not waiting for 2,000 years. Now, here's what I'd like to say on Romans 8.10, because I think Scott talked about that a little bit. The text here says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead. Now, when Scott answered this in his answers, and I didn't get a chance to do that, that's why I said we need five days to deal with a debate like this. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead. What body is that? that and I asked him the question, okay, uh, is, uh, is the body of Romans 8 verse 10, verse um, uh, the body of corruption in verse 21 and verse 23, uh, the same body that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. And he said, yes. Well, here is, and he claimed it's physical there, but he denied the same here because this body is dead because Christ entered it. That's the only way the old covenant body could die uh, from the perspective of putting that system to death and bring about new life. He had to cause them to die to that system so that they could become alive in the new where they would have life of the age. So, um, and it was the spirit that was in them that was going to raise that dead body. If that body wasn't dead, why did they need the spirit to raise it? Okay, thank you, William. Scott, you get a minute, a final word since the question was for you. Go ahead. Right. We kind of went all over the place on that one, but I'll kind of, you know, tag on here to Romans 8, 10. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Christ doesn't give death. All right. Why, why is the body dead? Well, because of sin and because of the law, because when the law, which is good, which was ordained to life, when the law goes to work on flesh in which sin has taken up residence, it brings about death. The body is dead because of sin. But if Christ be in you, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, well then, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit which dwelleth in you. Couldn't be any clearer than that. I, I just want to say something here, and I'll, I'll make this uh, short. As we look at these, these are letters, right? If you were going to write a letter to someone, it's important to, again, remember the context. Paul is writing a letter. He doesn't know what the future holds, right? So when he's talking about things, he's hopeful, he's anticipatory for the future, just as we are today about certain things. But we don't know what the future holds any more than Paul did. And so when we read these things where Paul includes himself, right, I, I think some people read that, they, they read it pedantically, and they look at it like Paul is, is prophetically speaking that these things are going to happen. And, and, and we make more of the scriptures, if that's possible to do, but I suppose it is. We make more of the scriptures and what the scriptures actually say. In other words, we read things into the scriptures. This is a letter. He's writing a letter about things that are going to come. The glory that has been about to be revealed in us. Well, what, do, what is the glory to be revealed? I thought Paul, wasn't Paul already in Christ? Isn't Jesus already glorified? There's some other things to think about with, with all of that, but I'll, I'll leave it there. It raises a lot more questions, and, and, and we could get into this text. We could spend a whole debate on this one right here. So, Okay, thank you very much there, uh, Scott and William. Next question comes in from Lazarus Conley, $5 Super Chat. I appreciate it. And he says it's a question for both. If spiritual death, a.k.a. sin, ended in 70 AD and you're raised in your pneumaticos soma today how and why do you or anyone for that matter sin so it is a question for both why don't we to be fair scott had the last word on the last one so scott let's start with you here and then we'll give william the last word on it All right well, that that this raises a conundrum right um Jesus says, the, the, or, or Paul says, the last enemy is death. And we know that, that it's sin that brings about, de uh, about death. And death re or, uh, sin receives its strength from the law, right? 
and 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 Paul is writing about that that this mess is going to be corrected one day. We're not going to have this process. But if if this is the case, if we are in our pneumatic coast right now, this is just one of those things that's puzzling to me. Our spiritual our spiritual bodies, right? There's still ongoing sin. There's still ongoing death. Um, there and 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 there's still you know not only when we think of physical death. But apparently there's still ongoing spiritual death because not everybody is born again. Um, and yet you have all of this, which I guess in theory just goes on for eternity. This, this is what restoration looks like. This is this is this is this is how God redeems things by letting enemies continue on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? Um doesn't make any logical uh sense. Not to mention it's a distortion of what the text says. But you have to do this is you have to do these type of things because in preterist, full preterist eschatology, you have the, the end point is 70 AD. It, it's like dispensational in some respects. Everything is built around the eschatology. And in this case, it's 70 AD. And, and, and so you have to make everything fit around that. It's no different here, but it leaves these problems of the ongoing nature. Of of sin and death that apparently has been defeated, but it's not really. Thank you, Scott. William, floor is yours. Go ahead. All right. Um, again, I hope the audience and the person who inquired understands that what I presented had to do with the realm where sin was committed or where sin was active. The text says for. Sin, uh, death reigned from Adam to Moses. It doesn't say that death reigns from Adam to Christ. It reigns from Adam to Moses. Moses' covenant ended in 70 AD. So we're talking about sin operating within a covenantal mode. Sin operating under Moses caused death because the human experience was incapable of freeing itself from that bondage, there had to be a better system. And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter eight. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, you have no condemnation. You can't be condemned to um, uh, be lost in this context. Who do not walk according to the flesh, that's according to the law, but according to the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Either we believe the Bible or we don't for what the law could not do in that it was weak through what not itself, not the law. It was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of sin, condemn sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. We are not righteous because we are righteous. We are righteous because Christ is righteous. And there is no flaw in the righteousness that he brought. And that was the righteousness of the law, uh, promised in the law, Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. Now, in terms of, of sin, in the um, in, in, as far as individuals are concerned, when you look in Jeremiah, the Bible says God would remember sin no more. He would not impute transgressions to one. Um, uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse um, 30 says, but every man sh shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats. If, if Christ has not dealt with sin, what has the new covenant brought us any different from the, from the old? If the promise was to get rid of death, was to destroy death, and we still end up with death in Christ, then Jesus' death has done no more than what being in Moses was all about. And I reject that totally. Um, in the new heavens and new earth of Isaiah 65, the Bible talks about the old man shall die a sinner, being a hundred uh, years of age, something to that uh, effect. I'm not quoting that exactly, but it talks about that. But that's talking about an individual. That's not talking about the system in which he's in and which he is forgiven through Christ. God says, I will remember their sins no more. So from that perspective, we should understand uh, the difference between being in a covenant where you sin, you die, and in a covenant where you are forgiven so that those transgressions are not held against you and do not keep you from experiencing the, ble experiencing the blessing of God. Let me have one more little tip 
Genesis 3, 22, after Adam sinned, God said, and now lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and live forever. If he had had access, he would have lived forever. That's exactly what we're doing today, eating of the tree of life and living forever. Thank you. Okay, thank you, William and Scott. To be fair, we got another question for both. And so now this time, we'll start with you, William. Scott, you get the last word. And so this comes in from SoCal Preston. Appreciate the support. $10 super chat. Question for both. Jehovah made a covenant only with Israel, his people, not other nations. Read Psalm 147, verses 18 to 19. And Leviticus 26, verse 46. And so his question is, and he's also given us those passages to put on screen. So I'll put on sc them on screen in a second. So he asks, who are the Old Testament saints you are talking about? What about those outside of the Mosaic covenant? Here's the first verse, Psalm 147. Okay, so William, we'll we'll start with you, and then we'll have you go second, uh, Scott. Okay. Well, the covenant that God made began with Genesis three and verse fifteen, and that was the covenant of destroying the seed of the serpent, which is quoted in uh, Romans sixteen and verse twenty, and that was fulfilled at the end of the old covenant age. That promise was carried through Abraham and then through his descendants, um, Jacob, Esau, and then eventually the, the 12, well, Jacob particularly, and the 12 tribes. So that's where the promise came. And then that promise carried through Moses. And Moses said in um, Acts chapter 3 um, that all the prophets had spoke, spoken about the promise of Abraham which says, in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, what was that promise? He said, God has uh, appeared to you first, or that uh, the gospel was to you first, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's sin. That's not a physical body. That's sin. But Paul takes the same verse in Galatians 3 and verse 8, and says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in you all the uh, nations would be blessed. So Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles, used the same text that Peter did in Acts chapter 3, and they both went two different directions with it to talk about Jew and Gentile becoming one in the body of Christ. And the last thing I will say, in um, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said the people of Nineveh would rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. He talked about the queen of, of Sheba as well. And um, so from that, I see salvation was out of the Judeans, but the salvation that Christ came to bring, according to Isaiah 49, was not to just Jacob. Or and and or Judah, and the tribes, but also to the nation. So I would leave it at that. Appreciate it, William. Scott, floor is yours. Go ahead. So, who are the Old Testament saints you are talking about? What about those outside of the Old Testament Old Testament Mosaic Covenant? Well, certainly. But you have Abraham. He's before the Mosaic Covenant. You got Noah. You got you got several of these. As we move forward, even under the Mosaic Covenant, you've got like Sir, uh, Naaman, the, the Syrian, um, who expressed faith in Christ, uh, faith in God, and, and was and was healed. Even wanted to worship uh, God, uh, taking some soil back to his nation. Um, I, I, you know, I would agree with with William in that um, you know salvation is is always been has been by faith, and the. The story of the Bible is all about how God is going to bring restoration to mankind and 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 to his his fallen creation. How is God going to do that? Well, God's going to choose one out of the many. He's going to choose Abraham and, and his seed, his his lineage. 
not for the sake of them alone, but that through the ones chosen, the many would be would be blessed. And so the, the whole the whole tilt of the Bible is about how God is is he is going to redeem mankind so that he can restore the creation. And how does he redeem mankind? He's going to redeem mankind through Israel. Israel is his vehicle of rescue. And and even then, Israel wasn't able to do what it ought to have done. And so you have Jesus who comes along, who embodies the vocation of Israel, even within himself, restores Jacob, restores Israel, and is a light to the nations. He fulfills the vocation for which Israel was called so that those who turn to Christ are redeemed. And as mankind is put right, ultimately then creation will be put right. Um, this is this is captured also in places like Isaiah. And I'll just end it with this. So, you know, Isaiah chapter 55. I'll just start here in verse 2. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew thee not shall run unto thee because of the holy, uh, because of the, the Lord thy God, for he is the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. And it goes on from there. And we, we find several of the, uh, you know, passages like that talking about the salvation of the nations the salvation of the gentiles which is which is what god had in mind all along he wanted to redeem mankind through israel his vehicle israel went wayward christ fulfilled israel's vocation people who look to christ are put right ultimately then creation will be put right because of a put right mankind so that's how i see the story the storyline of the bible working itself out Okay, Scott, thank you. William, thank you as well. Okay, now we have a question for William Bell. $50 super chat from 21st Century Mind. I greatly appreciate uh, the support and also the, the question. We've had just a ton of great engagement from our chat tonight. So, okay, the question is, neuroscientist Andrew Newberg states, all the brain is able to engage in spiritual experiences. Brain scans conducted show there are multiple parts of the brain involved in these experiences. Question, do you deny brain physics in the resurrection? Go ahead, uh, William. Okay, um, I don't deny brain physics in anything. Um, I figured this question would come up because it's been asked at least, this is the third time that it's come up to me. So I have a friend who deals with neuroscience. And uh, cause at the time it was first asked, I mean, I don't keep that kind of stuff in my head cause I'm not interested in it uh, from that point of view. I do know that the brain works effectively in terms of uh, dealing with various thoughts, et cetera. So I asked him again, I wish that I had had the Facebook chat up so that I could tell, you know, t uh, read his comments on it, but he deals with that and he affirms that. I mean, that's what neuroscience is all about. So we know that our thoughts are things, our thoughts affect whatever. So if a person goes through an experience where he perceives that or conceives that, obviously there's going to be some type of uh, neurotransmission, I guess, at some point in the brain. I'm not Ben Carson. I don't know how that works. But anyway, um, I don't deny that. So I don't know why that question keeps coming up. What's, you know, what? just makes no sense to me. I'm not trying to belittle the person who asks it, but I've never denied it. I just said, that's not my area of expertise. I'm not going to try to be a neuroscientist. Okay. I appreciate the, the response there, William. Scott, any thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think to me, this gets to the, to the nature, um, to the, to the very interesting nature of how, you know, the, the physical body and it interacts with, with, with this spiritual side of things. We, we are not just spirit um, and we are not just physical. We are both. They are married. And, and this goes back all the way to the very beginning of the Bible. Right. I mean, God created everything, all of all of creation and man, mankind was created from the earth for the earth. But 
but he's this heaven and earth creature because he's made from the the dirt but he also has the the breath of god he's he is a heaven and earth hybrid who who really stands at the at the precipice you might say between between heaven and earth so that he was created to image god's beauty and majesty and glory and creativity and order all of that into the earth while at the same time reflecting the praise and worship of creation back to god right and so you it, it's it, so then when you look at genesis and you see the garden of eden what is the garden of eden it's this heaven and earth spot where heaven and earth overlap and interlock from which then the temple and a, a tabernacle and the temple are like a microcosmos um, that, 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 that show that to where, what is God doing? He wants to get back to that. There was something about sin that separated all this mess. But what, what's cool here is this, this hits on something, right? Our, our mind. What are our minds? Our, our minds certainly, there's something, there's something about the spiritual part of us that is interacting somehow with physical matter, with the brain. But when we think about our minds, our minds aren't, you know, it's it's not physical. Our mind is non-material. It's it's non-temporal. Um, it's non-spatial. Where do you where where would you you know? It, it it demonstrates the real spiritual aspects of things, but yet at the same time we're in these physical bodies. And when we think about the interaction between spirit and physicality, and God redeeming fallen mankind, right? He's not going to do a halfway job. He's not he's not going to just redeem us partially. And this is this is what the the you know the resurrection of Jesus is a signpost. It's it's a foretaste and we have received the life to come. Um you know even now um being in Christ and yet the fullness of our redemption um awaits the future. It's it's been inaugurated. It's 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 already but it's not yet. And so, you know, that, that, that's a great thing for us in which in, in the future to, to think, you know, it's not just a platonic heaven when we're, you know, floating around in, in a non-material, non-spatial, non-temporal heaven somewhere. It's we're going to be back here on a redeemed, restored earth and, and bodies like as unto Jesus's raised body, doing what we were created to do all along which is to be the image of god and god's good earth so anyway thank you thank you scott william you get the final word question was for you go ahead um like i said i don't have very much more to say about it um i don't find a single scripture in the bible that says anything about uh, what we should know about neuroscience. I'm just yet to find it. Now we can extrapolate and uh, create all kinds of presuppositions that a certain text is talking about that. I think we do um, get some principles in scripture, you know, such as uh, Proverbs, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, et cetera. And we learn a lot of principles from that that people use in dealing with mind sciences from that perspective. But I don't see anywhere where Christ told us we need to be neuroscientists in order to understand the Bible. I just don't. It's a covenantal book, and we should study it from the perspective of covenants. That's why, in my opinion, that people fail to appreciate the um, the covenant aspect of the Bible. And I just want to say 70 AD was not the end of Christ's work it manifested a new beginning in terms of the consummated work. Christ didn't die for us to be in a state of hope forever. The scripture says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Well, what physiologically and neurologically does that do to a person? Um, it's creating a lot of havoc in the world, I can tell you that, because people think that all of these things that are going on um, are, God's, are, are prophetic, that Babies have to be bombed and killed, et cetera, in the name of the Lord. Um, fulfilling prophecies related to Amalek and all of that stuff. And um, so from that perspective, you know, I, I have no skin in the game relative to uh, neuroscience, what it means, what it doesn't mean, et cetera. I got books in my uh, library 
that talk about the brain. I'm not that motivated to read them all. I've read other types of books, but that's that's pretty much it. I don't see where we need to, I don't know, uh, have a brain scan to read the scriptures. William, thank you very much for that final word. Okay, we got another super chat here from SoCal Preston. Appreciate the support, $5. And it's another question for both. And so, William, you got the last word on the last question. So let's allow you to start with this one. And so his question is, was David left in hell after Jesus's resurrection? If so, why? And he points to Acts 2.27 and Acts 2.34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, would say yes. William, go ahead. Okay. Well, according to Scott, he had um but anyway uh, at least what i understand him to say on matthew 8 but first of all the word hell is not a biblical word the word from which hell is translated in acts i think is the word hades and then in um other passages of scripture it's from the term gehenna gehenna was a dump outside of Jerusalem, where they threw bodies to burn and uh, squelched the stench that came from them. Um, Hades, from what I've studied, is the equivalent of Sheol in the scripture. And everything that I personally have studied on that was that it was the grave in terms of a person um, dying his body went to the grave so when he said his his uh tomb is with us i don't think there was a spirit of david in the tomb but that's what he said he said his sepulcher is with us until this day so uh from that perspective um that's what i have to say about that uh but you it's correct david did not ascend into the heavens so he's affirming that Jesus did. David's body saw corruption. Jesus did not. William, I appreciate it. Scott, floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, it's an interesting passage because it says David didn't ascend to the heavens, and yet he saw the Lord, you know, speaking to his Lord, sit thou, sit thou at my right hand until I may call your enemies at your footstool. Uh, kind of interesting. Um, there, there. I mean, there's a whole lot. What, what William said is is um, is correct as far as kind of the Old Testament way, the old Hebraic way that they viewed um, Sheol or or the grave or or hell, um, and how they viewed the word soul. Soul is nephesh, and it, people didn't have a soul; they were a soul. Um, it, it, it was it was it encapsulated the entire human being. Um, another passage, you know, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The, the life is nephesh. The nephesh of the flesh is in, in the blood. Again, speaking about the, the human body. But somewhere, I mean, these ideas develop throughout history such that, you know, yes, people go into the grave, but is, is there some kind of spiritual part of themselves that, that continues on? And this is where the Sadducees said no. No, nope. Sadducee said there's no future resurrection and there's no intermediate state. There's none of that. And yet we and that's why they only held to the first five books of the Bible, because once you get beyond that, you know, you get that strange story about Samuel being raised from the grave. How does that work out? And then you've got the stuff going on at the, you know, the, the, the transfiguration moment where Moses and Elijah are somehow there. And they're talking to Jesus. And what what is that all about? And it 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 leads to this idea that there is there's some part of mankind's you know you know the the essence of who he is or whatever whatever you call that soul or spirit or whatever or the mind the psyche something continues on, and that 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 something is in in safe keeping with God, and. The cross was the pivotal moment, the death, burial, and resurrection, in which those who were alienated with God could be with God. Um, 
and, and again, I we went through some of that, or I argued some of that before, so I won't say anything more on that. But yeah, I believe Old Testament saints prior to 70 AD absolutely were in heaven um, because Christ died for the sins that were under the covenant for for their benefit um, so that they could be saved, not just for the contemporary generations between 30 and 70 AD. So, Okay, thank you, gentlemen. For your responses, David, appreciate the $5 super chat. All right, next one comes in from 21st Century Mind. $20 super chat. Thank you very much. Question for William Bell. Many former full preterists have stated that full preterism leads to the Israel-only doctrine. Are you open to debating the topic of Israel only? Go ahead. Uh, actually, William, could you elaborate on what, for, for anyone who doesn't know, what Israel only is? It, it might be important to. Okay. Uh, it, it kind of focuses on the question that SoCal Preston asked before, because they use the same verse, uh, which is uh, Psalm 147. I uh, can't remember the exact uh, verse, but it's it's uh, that chapter and others that basically say that um, the covenant was only to Israel and that. Um, once it was fulfilled in 70 AD, there's um, no more, uh, you know, uh, involvement of God as far as the covenant is concerned with people. So it basically, it, everything is fulfilled. That's it. And basically, as far as the Bible is concerned, kind of pack up and go home. There's no uh, uh, further emphasis beyond that. I don't subscribe to that. I have had a uh, written discussion. It was an informal one with um, uh, Jason DaCosta at one point. And at some point in the future, I may engage in another debate on it. I'm not that interested in debating on it. I, I don't even consider myself a debater. Um, I teach for the most part, and sometimes I will, uh, I will debate. But it's not like I'm running around looking for a debate. Scott asked me to debate this, uh, and so I did because it's an area that I knew that he had some um, some uh, viewpoints on preterism. He had debated it before, and I saw that he was a respectable gentleman, and so I accepted that. Um, but that's what uh, the Israel-only uh, situation is. I do know also that there is a gentleman who has sent some responses to them or to some of them, and there's not been a response to that. I'd like to see their comments on that um, from that uh, from that perspective. William, appreciate it and glad you did this debate. This has been an excellent debate. And so, okay, so Scott and William, you both always make for a good debate, put it that way. So, okay, Scott, any thoughts? You know, Israel, Israel only, they, they sometimes will call themselves, con, you know, consistent preterists, try to set themselves apart from from full preterists. You know, I, as I started the debate and, and I mentioned Second Timothy, chapter number two, where, where verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their 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 word will eat, eat as doth the canker of, of whom is. Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of Herod, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And this is how this goes, right? When you start to redefine things and you start to, everything else begins to unravel. And there are other time statements that, you know, I started to ask some questions, but I would challenge anybody to do this. And this is what, this is what Israel only people have done. When you look up all the untils in the New Testament, which is a time statement. This is you're you're sealed until the day of redemption. Um, you know you'll you'll preach the gospel until the end, right? All these until statements. Well, if if until happened in 70 A.D., then there's there's no more of any of that. In which then people arrive at this conclusion. Well, this was just all for for Israel, and ultimately what that does is it's gangrene and it robs people of of hope. This is why people become atheists. This is why there's many in those Israel-only camps that they, they have denied the faith altogether, um, and it's that is the natural progression. This is this is why this is this is very dangerous because it it we're reading in the same words 
but the definitions don't don't they, they don't match different definitions and this is how all all you know false teachings start you tweak something you redefine it and the next thing you know it unravels in other places and it's affecting your soteriology and your pneumatology and your christology and and all these different things and this, this is why it's a big deal um so yeah uh it's a i i i know full preterist uh, don't like debating Israel only because Israel only makes some good points because they're at least consistent with the scriptures. If you're going to hold this full preterist view, you got to you got to take those until time statements into consideration too, and you can't bend those and massage those to make it work so that you're somehow, you know, going to have hope too. It doesn't work that way. You, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's either one or the other. So you choose. Um, and, and what I would just tell people is. Listen, if you're being bewitched by full preterism, just stop. You, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. And the things that you think you might be coming to conclusions on, guarantee there's probably answers that you have not yet considered. Um, and so I'll leave it. I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Scott. William, you get the last word because the question was for you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the reasons why I don't subscribe to, um, the Israel only is because like a text that S uh, Scott cited, uh, Matthew 24, 14, when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached to all the nations, then shall the end come? Well, they preached, uh, that was done even before 70 AD. The end that was in mind was the, uh, end of the old covenant. It was not the end of the gospel because he said in the same text, heaven and earth, will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Ephesians 3, 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Uh, Scott wanted to, you know, throw another stab back at uh, 2 Timothy 2, 18 and 19. That text says that they were saying the resurrection was passed already. Uh, we don't say that. I tried to point out to him when we were discussing it, that the resurrection in uh, under consideration in that text is tied to, or the, the uh, time frame there is tied to the destruction of the temple. We don't have an eschatology that says the resurrection was consummated prior to the time that the temple was destroyed. When I talk about the resurrection of the dead ones, those were dead ones who were raised uh, into the body of Christ at the time of uh, the coming of the kingdom in 70 AD. Uh, Scott and I differ on when that happened, uh, but I do agree in terms of the scripture says when they were sown, because that's taught in Hosea chapter two, it's taught in Jeremiah 31. And I believe that the sowing for both the living and the dead occurs at the same time, but the dead are not being sown in a body. They're being sown in Christ so that they can uh, die to sin in, in terms of uh, not being any longer under that uh, old covenant where they were not able to enter. Jesus was the first one, the Bible says in, in first, um, uh, or rather in Hebrews 6 and, and, and verse 19, that he was the forerunner. So nobody went in before he did. He was the forerunner to appear in the presence of God for us. And then others follow him. And, um, and that's the order. It's not that they go in first, as uh, has been said tonight, and then Jesus comes later. That makes them the first fruit instead of him. And going into the most holy place was the consummated uh, consummation of the marriage. It was also the time of uh, entering uh, into the uh, the uh, consummated state of the kingdom. And by the way, one last, the kingdom was to be established in judgment, not in inauguration. Isaiah 9, 7 says it was to be established in judgment. So not until judgment arrived would the kingdom be established. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, William. I got to say, Scott and William, you guys have impressive endurance uh, as we've been going close to four hours. So great job to the both of you. And you both clearly know your stuff. This is one of those debates that are rewatchable. I'll definitely be going through this again because you've provided us all with just so much information that there's so much information to digest and think on. So William Scott, again, thanks so much. Okay, so this one comes in from Byzantine Baptist. There's a ring to that. So $10 super chat, appreciate it. Question for Bell. 
William Bell. Hebrews 11.35 references 2 Maccabees 7, verses 7 to 23. Since the verses in Maccabees are referring to bodily resurrection, specifically verses 13 to 14 and 23, doesn't that mean that Paul believes in a bodily resurrection? Go ahead, William. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think that uh, in terms of, uh, Paul believes in bodily resurrection, but he believes in covenant body resurrection. So just as I said, the ministration of death, that was the body where death occurred when they transitioned out of that body, which they were doing at the time of the first century, second Corinthians chapter three and verse 18, when they transition out of that one in consummation, and that's the change that was taking place in first Corinthians 15. So it wasn't totally future. It was a change already underway. So it's if it's physical, they should have had physical resurrection first and not second, according to the text, because it was the natural that was first and not the spiritual. But, um, I'm trying to vaguely remember the text in Maccabees because I think there are two. One of them has to deal with these uh, son, five sons or uh, of uh, this mother who were uh, tortured, et cetera. But there's another example where there were some men who had committed what, uh, I think they went up to some feast or whatever or, or something and they took out their daggers under their coats and they killed a bunch of folk. So the individual or the per I can't remember who it is I got to go back and read it but they paid money to have their sins removed because they know those people committed sin before they died so he went and got some he, he brought money in order to pay for them to be delivered from their sin and uh, felt that that's the way they were going to be raised uh when you look at the Pharisees and Josephus I think one chapter is, is, is antiquities 18. Uh, there's another one in wars, but when he talks about resurrection for the Pharisees, for the Sadducees and the Essenes, um, one of the doctrines of the Pharisees was that they would be raised under the earth. In other words, not come back into this world, contrary to what I've heard. That's one view. Now, I think there was another view floating around where some of them did believe they would come back. Um, the Sadducees, of course, didn't believe any of that. So it depends on who you're listening to in terms of what these views of resurrection was. One of the reasons Israel uh, or some in Israel had that idea that they were going to come back into the, you know, they were going to be raised back into this land because they thought they were going to be raised back in their land in um, um, Palestine. And Jesus said, no, that's not going to happen. Or his point was, you know, that's not the place where worship is going to take place and where people will, will um, uh, serve God. Uh, neither in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem because it's no longer geocentric. So um, the land over in Palestine has no covenantal uh, holy uh, connotation about it unless there are some holy people over there doing the will of God. William, thank you very much. Scott, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, Donnie, can you share my screen, please? Yes. I just want to show this here. This is... um. This is a screenshot from the resurrection of the Son of God. This is um, this is a part of a volume by N.T. Wright, and he comments on this, and it's really good. Um, th there's a reason that full preterism has, you know, that it, it is a it is a novel thing. It is it has only appeared within really the last two hundred years. Um, N.T. Wright says, uh, speaking on Second Maccabees, this book, uh, Second Maccabees, provides. Far and away, the clearest picture of the promise of resurrection anywhere in the period. And, and it does. And here's some of the verses from, from what the questioner asked. I'll just read some of them. You are cursed wretch, said the second brother. You dismiss us from the present life, but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we died for his laws. In other words, these, these were martyrs. They were giving up their lives and they were giving up their lives because they had the express hope and purpose that they would be physically raised from the, from the grave. The third brother put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands and said nobly, I got these from heaven, and because of his laws, I disdained them, and from him I hope to get them back again. When he was near death, the fourth brother said, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of mortals and to cherish the hope that God gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. Now, there's a reason why the Sadducees denied the resurrection of the grave because people like this 
who think that they're going to be raised back to life again, who are willing to put their necks on the line and actually die for their cause. Well, that's a real threat to political power. Um, all of it just illustrates, you know, as far as what was the history of the time people or the time period and what did they mean by resurrection? And through and through, clearly what they meant by resurrection, not was a, you know, non-material spiritual afterlife. The pagans already had that. They believed in an actual bodily, physical resurrection. Um, and so, yeah, Second Maccabees is a is a great place to look. This is a great resource, Resurrection of the Son of God um, by N.T. Wright, for, for those who are interested more in the history um, of the subject. Um, he comes from a partial preterist point of view as well. So on to there. Okay, thank you very much, Scott, for that response. Question was for you, William, and so you get the last word. All right. Um, Hebrews 11.35 uh, says that they refuse to be brought back to life again. In hope of a better resurrection. I think we need to let the scriptures define it. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he wasn't telling them that he's a physical body. If he is, who has been raised in Christ to this date? Scott's denying it. He says nobody has. It's still future. I guess with the exception of Abraham and, and the patriarchs. But the other point is, um, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, they didn't understand their hope. So if we go there and say they had a greater understanding and knowledge than uh, what Peter says they did not know, and you can see some of that with what God revealed to Daniel in those dreams when he first revealed some things to them. But Peter said, um, and I'll, I'll quote the verse, they were searching what and what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And then it says it was not revealed to them. So how did they know? It wasn't revealed to them. Those things were revealed through the Spirit. So I can't see how that becomes the uh, support of that. They had lots of beliefs back then. And if you talk about preterism, um, generating various beliefs among people, how many different beliefs has futurism generated? As a matter of fact, that's why we have all these different uh, groups, eschatologically speaking, in futurism. There's the Adventist, there's the Jehovah Witness, there's the Mormon, there's the uh, Pentecostal, uh, there's the Dispensationalists, and, you, and on and on and on. Why? Because each of them have something about their eschatological views that they can't accept from the other one. And so they've developed into all of these. So just mentioning that doesn't mean that preterism itself is a danger. It just means that people simply have to study and decide. But all of that came about initially from a futurist point of view. And we're coming about trying to help. And what's happening is a lot of the people who were holding those views and are holding those views are coming out of them to become preterists. Yeah, there are some people who have defected from preterism, but how many have defected from futurism? There are atheists there too. So that's not an argument that's going to make preterism bad because somebody misinterpreted 2 Timothy 2 that says the resurrection was passed already before the temple was destroyed and tried to ascribe that to us. You didn't have to stop at 2 Timothy. You could have gone to 2 Thessalonians um, and looked at them who were saying that Christ had already come in the 50s. Well, if Christ had come, that would have meant that physical resurrection had already come, if that was what they were talking about. But how could they believe physical resurrection had already come by stating it 
as they did. They didn't believe it had anything to do with the renovation of the earth, yet they believed Jesus had come. Their concept of the resurrection, of the coming of Christ, of the end of the world, etc., was not the concept that futurists have in this materialistic concept. And when Paul corrected them, he didn't say anything about the nature that they had of the coming of Christ. He only corrected the time. He said it will not happen until this happens first. He gave them signs of the time, not signs of the nature. All right, William, I appreciate that final word. Gentlemen, we're down to the last question. It's the last super chat, but it's broken up into two. <laughs> so apparently 21st century minds a big fan of you, uh, William Bell. Maybe you both have a history. I don't know. But the last question is a two-parter. And so let's do a power round. We'll let you answer this one first, and then I'll throw up the, uh, the, the second one, William. So here we go. $20 super chat. Appreciate the support. And so he is asking, did the first century saints experience brain activity? So it looks like this goes back to the brain activity question earlier to process the change to immortality. If so, does brain activity prove the resurrection was physical? Do you deny neurons were involved in the resurrection? William, go ahead. I don't have any evidence from a neuroscience, neurological point of view to respond to that question. Take it okay. to take it to a neuroscientist and let him answer it. I know this. I haven't been raised physically from the dead, so I don't have that experience. Talk to the people who are arguing for physical resurrection. They should have a better understanding and idea of it than I do. Or I can give you the scientist number that I talk to and you have that conversation with him. Okay, appreciate it. Second part, to be fair, William, you get the opportunity to respond to your critics, just like Scott would have the opportunity as well. Okay. So he's asking if you want to, let's see here. Will you retract your statements that the resurrection was non-physical and how did the saints experience it? No, I'm not going to retract my statement that the resurrection was non-physical from the perspective of uh, what I've argued in this debate, because I don't believe that it was a physical resurrection. So why would I retract that? When we talk about you, you don't have to have a uh, uh, a physical resurrection to have activity in your brain unless we're all brain dead here tonight and whatever's going through our brains is affecting something tonight it's affected him that's why he's got the the um, uh, question on the screen something he heard in his head caused him to take a physical reaction and post that on the screen so there's his answer okay thank you William Scott we're just going to move on to the next question because we're at the four hour mark and we got to <laughs> kind of wrap things up. So we got the final question here. And to be fair, though, OK, what we'll do is uh, it's a question for both. So, William, we're going to give you the first response and then, Scott, you'll get the last word since you didn't get to respond to the previous question. So I appreciate it. Just amazing support tonight for uh, tonight's debate. Our chat really is the our audience, I should say, is the life and blood of this channel. That's why we can give you uh, full time debates. For all you debate addicts out there, I'm one of them. So Kingdom in Context, appreciate the support, $50. He says, thank you, Donnie. I appreciate it, uh, Sean, for hosting these. My pleasure. Keep going. Yes, we get a bonus question here, gentlemen. So his question for both. Is the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21, is that literal or is it figurative? William, go ahead. All right, thank you. We have to be careful when we ask, is something literal versus figurative? Uh, it is literal because spiritual things are literal. God is spirit. Nobody's ever seen him, but he's a literal God. That doesn't mean he has flesh, has, uh, flesh and bone or blood like we have, but he's real. That's a literal God. Uh, God. Spiritual things are just as real as non-spiritual uh, things or uh, uh, from that perspective. Now, in terms of what is the nature of the um, New Jerusalem, uh, Paul talks about two Jerusalems in both um, Galatians when he talks about one was in um, Mount Sinai and or, or the Jerusalem that now is, of course, Palestine. That's what he was talking about. But it was based on, um, you know, the old covenant system that he uh, uses in that context. And then he talked about the Jerusalem that was above. Well, in Daniel 2, Daniel talked about a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. Jesus described that 
as a kingdom that does not come with observation. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, again, he says, if the earthly house, this tent, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That is the one that came down in Revelation 21. That's not a physical kingdom any more than the spiritual body of Christ in terms of the church is a physical church. Now, there are physical beings in it in terms of our uh, what we call physical, but in terms of our soteriological stance before God, we are spiritual from that perspective because God wrote, I mean, Paul wrote to them in both in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and again in Galatians chapter 6, as well as talked about them in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, so from that perspective, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And he said, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So that's the new Jerusalem, which is heavenly. That's that citizenship that was in heaven. Um, but that has come down to be with man. And that's what the coming of Christ is all about. That has come down to be with man. And, and those who are uh, obedient to God are um, in that um, tabernacle, in that system. Thank you. William Bell, Scott, floor is yours. Go ahead. Is the New Jerusalem of Revelation 21 literal or figurative? Um, and, and I would probably kind of maybe change this if I can to say, you know, spir spiritual or physical, maybe. Um, it's both. Uh, the, the answer is is um, both. Remember, that the, the, the tilt of the Bible is a reunification of of heaven and earth that's that's ultimately what we're what we're going for and and that work was inaugurated with christ he is the first man of the new creation when he physically rose from the from the grave something miraculous happened his physical body went to heaven and he sent his spirit to come and dwell us so you have something physical that goes into heaven and something spiritually that goes into something physical here on the earth which is why in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 22, he had put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over the church, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Again, the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might bring together that which is in heaven and in earth. I'm kind of paraphrasing, botching it a little bit uh, that, that in verse number 10 of Ephesians 1. The whole idea is this reunification which the Bible says was was it began with the cross, with the cross. Um, it's, it's a climactic point in history, such that if we are in Christ and we are his body, right? It, it, it's why we can be said to be in heaven, seated with him in heaven, and yet we're here on earth. It's just as Jesus said, that, that where I am, there you might be also. And so... Hebrews chapter 12, you have come unto Mount Zion. They, they were, they've come to Mount Zion. So there is this reunification happening, but the full consummation of that has, has not taken place. Why? Because in order to have a, a, a renewed, a renewed city, a renewed temple that comes upon a, a, a renewed earth, you need a renewed earth, which is why in Revelation chapter 20 and 21, what, what do we see? We see a redeemed humanity, i.e. the new Jerusalem, comes from where? It comes from heaven to earth. In other words, the Bible isn't about us escaping this earth and going to heaven. The Bible is about the reunification of heaven and earth, whereby the new Jerusalem, in which we are part of right now in a spiritual sense, will ultimately physically manifest itself when the, the heaven and earth are reunited. Um, and we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. And that's the thing that, again, full preterists disregard because it's all spiritual. It has nothing to do with the, the physicality of things. And of course, the very resurrection of Jesus refutes that because it wasn't just spiritual. It was very much physical. It is both. Um, God, God wanted to redeem wholes, not just souls. And we need to keep that in mind. So, so yes, it's a, it's a, it's not an either or. It's, it's a both and. 
um, and we're part of it now. And the ultimate consummation of that is still yet in the future. All right, gentlemen, we have made it to the end of the Q&A. And what a Q&A it was, hour and 10 minutes. And this was a comprehensive debate. This is what, uh, this is what we all wanted. And William, Scott, you, you gave us what we wanted. So I appreciate your time. Uh, the chat has had an excellent time, very lively. And as you both have seen, lots of great questions. And we still only got through a very small percentage of the questions. So if we got through all the questions, we'd be here till same time tomorrow. So if you guys want to go put on a pot of coffee, we could do that. Or we can wrap things up now. So <laughs> tongue in cheek, William, Scott, excellent job. Gentlemen, did you guys have any final words, final thoughts before we shut her down for tonight? Start Scott? with you, William. Go I'll, ahead. Um... Okay, sorry with you, Scott. Go ahead. <laughs> you guys could battle yeah, for the final words. I'll, uh, I'll, let, I'll let William have the final word there. Um, just thank you. Thank you to, to William and, and Standing for Truth. You know, no one forces anybody to go into a debate like this. Um, and so appreciate the willingness to, to discuss these issues. Um, you know, I tried to raise in this debate something that um, I, I don't hear talked about. Um, there, there is a, there is a, you know, this idea that the dead ones uh, weren't raised, that is, Old Testament saints weren't raised until 70 AD. Um, even if we're just talking about resurrection just being spiritual, if it's if it's all just spiritual, it defies 1 Thessalonians 4 when it says the dead in Christ, the dead ones, will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air. Right. And so you have this backwards thing. So it, it doesn't work. It doesn't jive. I don't hear that uh, being talked about much. Um, and, and that is that is a that is a gaping hole. And it reveals the inconsistencies, I believe, within uh, within the movement. But all that said, there's much more that we could talk about. There's much more that we didn't get to. And, um, you know, I, I just again, I'm appreciative of, of willing uh, William being uh, willing to to do this debate. Um, and, uh, and and thank you to the audience who stuck with us throughout this time. So appreciate it. Appreciate all the questions. Scott, great final words. Yes, I appreciate our passionate audience. It's an important topic. It's a controversial one. And so nothing wrong with, with a little passion. And I appreciate the knowledge from the both of you, Scott and William. Just a couple of true professionals, the both of you. You can tell you're both experienced. And so, William, let's hand it to you. Final words, final thoughts. And thanks for doing this. All right. Uh, thank you, Donnie. I appreciate your um, allowing us to engage on this platform. Uh, you keep things very orderly and organized, uh, very professional. I'm uh, really um, appreciative of that. Thank you, Scott, for engaging. I appreciate the information that you supplied, and I'm sure uh, you will. Uh, I will uh, interact with that as you will with the information that, that I have sent you as well, uh, not just here in this discussion, but uh, but a little bit later as well. And to the audience, we appreciate you for the conversations you've had, as well as the questions submitted. I didn't mean to be rude to anybody in responding. Uh, I don't know what is the issue behind this one question, but you know that's just the way I see it. And I uh, hope that you find the end or the aim that you're looking for with that particular question, whether I ever um, say yay or nay about it. Uh, lastly, uh, I would uh, like to say that um, it is incorrect to ascribe to me the concept that the dead ones were not being raised. Uh, I believe that they were all sown at the same time, both the New Testament saints as well as the old, because the only person who could do the sowing was Christ. And as a result, they were being raised. And that's what the language says in the text. So I would say that Scott would need to prove at some point or examine at some point all the verb tenses in 1 Corinthians 15 in order to get a better grasp on what was taking place and see if a physical body paradigm can be successfully argued in that text. There are too many present tense verbs that are in that text about action that was going on. Now, it works for the spiritual, but it will not work for the physical because he can't have an already physical but not yet physical. 
he has to have an already spiritual and a not yet or a never happen physical. And that's not the way already but not yet works. That was one of the problems that uh, existed with uh, C.H. Dodd and with Albert Schweitzer. C.H. Uh, Dodd believed that eschatology was all basically at the cross, even what we call the end time things. And, uh, and that's where the term realized eschatology comes from. And then Albert Schweitzer, on the other hand, because he saw the um, futurist aspect uh, of these passages, placed everything in the future, and both positions were wrong. They come together when you see an eschaton based on these imminent statements that was at hand, shortly to come to pass, about to occur, happening in their lifetime before some of them died, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, which is why some of the older scholars and now some of the uh, later ones are beginning to see, they use those passages to say Paul was saying these things were happening in their lifetime. You can't have it both ways. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52 says- William, I just want to make sure you're not bringing up no, I'm not. I don't, want this, to be, I don't want this to be another closing statement. No, no, more, no. more so, final word. Because okay, right. Scott's going to feel like he wants to respond to things. So I just. Well, I was to... basically responding to some things he was saying because he yeah. he brought up things about First Corinthians 15. So that's the only reason. But if I've stepped out of bounds, I apologize for that. It was not no intentional. Word, no. Okay. A, 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 a take 15 seconds. Make sure you wrap things up. I just yeah. want to make sure that well, I'm, I'm wrapping because up the now. people in the audience are going to think I'm giving you guys no, 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 no. closing. No. I mean, if you need to give him time, give him time. And I'm okay with that. Um, but I will end right there. I'm just saying, I, you know, it was a great experience. Um, I came into it um, very tired, no sleep <laughs> and uh, no rest. And uh, yet, because we engaged, I, I feel much better at, at the end of it. And so thanks to you, and I'm grateful to God that we were able to do it, and th that's pretty much it. So have a great one. Amen. I appreciate it, uh, William Bell. You both did a fantastic job. Uh, that's what these debates are good for, natural energy boosts. And so, William, you didn't look tired at all. Scott, you didn't look tired at all. And I know we could uh, easily do another four hours, and I can listen to the both of you for another four hours. And so, gentlemen, Thank you for the final words, final thoughts. Again, excellent debate. I do really appreciate uh, the time you've given to us, especially because I know how busy uh, you both are. And to the audience, I appreciate uh, just how engaged everybody is. Of course, I appreciate the passion on this topic. Thank you so much for uh, all the support. And really just thank you for hanging with us for the last uh, four plus hours. I've really enjoyed my time here. And so again, Scott, William, I'll say it one last time. Uh, God bless. Thank you for uh, your time. And we're going to wrap things up. Sandy for Truth is out.